draft long-term plan amendment and draft 2023-24 annual plan. Are there any apologies? Noting um, Councillor Proctor, we'll move Councillor Proctor back to his apologies. Second, Councillor Jennings, all those in favour? Against, carried. Um, late items will be noted under uh, 2.4, um, so there has been a couple of late uh, submissions received. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Jennings. So Mr Mayor, I was just going to ask a question. I guess um, being a small community, we all know many of the submitters. And so rather than declare an interest uh, in just, just through association, I thought it might be appropriate at, if at the time prior to the submission that uh, in person that if, if anyone did have a, a personal association, we might just flag that at the time. Is that, are you comfortable with that? I think... Um I don't think that's necessary, to be honest. I do. I think everyone just needs to acknowledge in their own minds that they are being open and uh, willing to listen to all submitters, uh, regardless of their association. As you say, many of us have um, relationships or association with different groups, uh, but we come to this meeting to hear all that. And um, I mean, there may well be a time of deliberation. Uh, some sort of uh, acknowledgement of a conflict, but I think for, at this stage I'm you know, comfortable with a, a, that sort of, um, sort of those motives in terms of listening to our um, submitters. Just I to... Will, um, sorry, sorry um, Councillor Tamiha. So I, I will um, just disclose that and acknowledge that as the chairperson of Huia Marae, um, this submission was made on behalf of the hapu um, by myself, um, but also wanted to acknowledge that I'm here with an open mind at the table um, to listen to our submitters and uh, before we go ahead and make decisions. Thank you. Just turn your mic off, Justin. Thank you. So, um, before we get into hearing some minutes, we just need to move uh, 2.1, 2.2, uh, 2.3 and 2.4. Uh, that the um, report, um, 23 slash 296, receipt of submissions and hearing of submitters, draft long-term plan amendment and draft 2023-24 annual plan be received, that this matter is all decision be recognised as not significant in terms of Section 76 of the Local Government Act 2002. The Council received the submissions on the draft long-term plan amendment and draft 2023-24 annual plan lodged by 4pm 1st of May 2023. In 2.4, that Council received the late submissions on the draft long-term plan amendment and draft 2023-24 annual plan lodged after 4 p.m. 1 May 2023. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? Against carried. Thank you. So, um, yeah, welcome especially to those that have not been through this process before um, to the hearing of submissions, which is a, a you know pretty critical uh, part of the whole process. Um, acknowledging to um, before we start, that the work that has gone into preparing us for this day, um, the fact that we've had 22 consultation events, that we've been quite innovative and uh, proactive in terms of trying to engage and uh, connect with our community with uh, lots of different ways, Facebook Live posts, for example, and, and things like that. The fact that we have received 414 written submissions uh, and 68 of those uh, want to actually speak to us. Um, I think it indicates that it's been a job well done. Noting that uh, you will have received only uh, just in the last little while the draft responses to um, from officers in regards to the submitters that we are hearing today. Um, they will be loaded onto uh, the website for further 
um, reading, um, but acknowledge that you won't have had time um, to read them uh, before now, but that you may well, through the process, be able to quickly, um, um, you know, sort of acknowledge them and what they've said. Obviously, there is more to come in terms of uh, those responses in a more detailed way uh, before deliberations, and um, we will, um, you know, again, ensure that councillors have full uh, knowledge and um, are aware of the issues in front of us. Also, um, remind councillors that um, we do give advice to uh, those that are appearing uh, in terms of how uh, this uh, process goes, that we um, that they are given 10 minutes, that they uh, are advised that they need to leave time for questions. Um, we also set some ground rules around uh, behaviour, um, about um, mentioning or accusations of staff, uh, councillors or um, contractors, um, and that we ask them to keep to uh, the matters contained in the long-term plan amendment. So we will try to do that as much as possible. Uh, Ten minutes goes pretty quick. Um, so I, I would encourage you, if you do have questions or anything that you wish to uh, say, then to be in quick, because I will try to keep to time as much as possible. Noting that uh, in your uh, submission pack, you will have got the schedule and submissions of those that we are hearing today. On the reference to them, you will see the number of the submission um, and also what the page number in your uh, folders is, because many, some of you will have noted on those folders rather than on the hearings um, submission folder. Um, so we will try to be as deliberate as possible in ensuring that you know where we're at, um, but um, we will manage this as best we can. So... Two minutes, uh, ten past two, we are on time, and uh, I hope we can remain so for the rest of the uh, time. But anyway, could I welcome then um, Brett Russell as our first submitter. Thank you, Brett. You've just heard me explain the process. Thank you. Yes, all yours. Uh, Kia ora, Your Worship, Councillors, Chief Executive and Council Staff. Thank you so much for enabling me to follow up my written submission for the personal presentation regarding long-term plan and annual plan 23-2023-24. I come here today wholly as a Foxton Beach resident ratepayer, irrespective of any other roles I may hold as far as our community is concerned. At the outset, I wish to congratulate Council on implementing a range of innovative ways of engaging with our community in addition to the usual submission process. I'm thinking here of your Facebook Lives, a citizens panel, coupled with a councillor, that's Korero Horofanua, infrastructure visits and so on. These have gone a long way to help ensure our community makes its views known and successfully navigates the submission process. So well done to you and the council staff who have been actively engaged in this process, making this progress work so well as it has done. In terms of my own submission, I concur with council's preferred options regarding one, rates review for a fairer distribution of rates, that is option two, calculate the general rate based on capital value, two, the Levin, the Levin landfill's future, that is option two, keep the land, Levin landfill closed with revenue generated from alternative uh, site use determined through a well-developed waste management and minimisation plan, three, our key water infrastructure, that is option one, increase the budget to deliver the projects we need, assisted by increased development contributions to reflect increased costs from the revised waters program. It's interesting to note that on page 13 of the consultation document comments, 
community outcomes will stay the same and that these are essentially goals for the well-being of the community. I say the status quo must not always be our goal. I seek instead the more loftier goal that we should always all strive for continuous improvement in all that we do. Bit of tongue-in-cheek there, maybe. In the very second paragraph on page one of the consultation document, it is written, we are also proposing to make changes to some of our fees and charges and funding projects through the Foxton Beach freeholding account through the annual plan. Furthermore, page 57 summarises some of the key background features of this account, noting too Council's commitment to reviewing this policy in the near future. It goes on to mention the Te Awaha Foxton Community Board manages the fund and would like to consult on the following proposal. Funding $500,000 from the Foxton Beach freeholding account for the Foxton Pool Redevelopment Project. In this regard, I acknowledge the Te Awahu Foxton Community Board's recent decision to make a $500,000 contribution from the Foxton Beach freeholding account towards the Foxton Pool Redevelopment Project. But under Section 81, this breaches the FBFA current council policy. I advocate, therefore, that the current review of this policy also reviews the $5 million minimum cash balance. In keeping with the 14 March 2023 advice council received from Brookfield's lawyers read the account, consultation with the Foxton Beach community may be appropriate. I think it is appropriate particularly where the decision involves a significant departure from the policy. In my capacity as chairman of the Foxton Beach Progressive Association Incorporated, I would be pleased to organise an event to enable just such consultation to take place. In closing, I sincerely wish you all the very best in your important deliberations and decision-making on this and all other aspects of the LTP and annual plan. Nahumihi. I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thanks, Brent. Um, Brent, sorry. Um, and nice to start off with some positive comments about the way we've engaged uh, with the community over this uh, process. Are there any questions of Brent? Deputy Mayor. Yeah, th thanks, Brent, very much for your submission. I guess I'm focused on the um, the issue around the Fox and Beach freeholding account, whether or not we should access it for the uh, 500000 and And in the important role as chair of the Aggressive Association, um, you've talked about using that as a mechanism to engage with the community. Uh, my, my concern is around timing. Submissions have now closed. So have you had the opportunity prior to presenting today to engage using that mechanism so that we can have some feedback? There's been no formal meeting of the association. I uh, thought that it could be done perhaps after the submission process. But if it's a case of timing, um, uh, as I say in my presentation, I think the review of the policy should take precedence over the um, making funds available for such a large amount, especially given that it will take it below the current minimum threshold that is prescribed by current council policy. That is the $5 million. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Oh, oh, thank you. So really, it might be a question around process to officers, uh, whether such a meeting, whether that could factor in with the timing would allow a meeting to feed that into our deliberations process. We've had, we've had, they have had the opportunity through the many different forums, so we acknowledge the fact that the process has been fairly robust that way, but putting aside the policy issue, which can be dealt with at a later date, I just wonder if there is the opportunity and the timing that allows the use of the Progressive Association to have a public meeting so that we can use that also as a means of feeding it. Does the timing permit that? Yes. Do you want to respond to that? No. If you, well, the question has been asked of officers, so I'll let you respond. Um, look, I think it's possible for us to achieve that between now and deliberation reports. Um, uh, would need to happen in the next 10 days, and so officers would need to pretty promptly work with Mr Russell to see if we could 
um, pick that up. It's that fine balance between the formal engagement versus the informal engagement, noting it would not be counted as a formal submission, but as additional feedback and community intelligence to inform elected members. Yes, the Jennings. Oh, sorry. Oh, so, final question. So, on, on the back of that advice, uh, question then to you, Brett, whether you feel it's something you could do within that time period, public meeting, and maybe notify council laws and so on too, so that we can attend? Yes, I think it could be done in that time frame. And appreciate the input. Councillor okay, so Jennings. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm just a little bit confused, Brett, because. So are you saying there should be a separate consultation process about the the policy departure? Because I was under the impression that, like, so on page 57 of the consultation document, it acknowledges that there will be a departure from the policy and that the balance would reduce to 4.2 million. So haven't we been through a consultation process that would enable people from Fox and Beach to express their views on that. Oh, that. That's why I'm just genuinely trying to understand what additional step we're looking to try and achieve, given that, yeah, we've just been through a month-long consultation process already. Um, I very much appreciate that uh, um, observation comment, uh, Sam. My thoughts would be that the uh, the context on, on which this has been presented is in a wider document covering the entire Horofanua as opposed to um, enabling the specific uh, uh, folk who make up the Fox and Beach community to have a to concentrate on a specific issue of very much of concern of Fox and Beach, and I think it would be a good idea to uh, let them have their say on that matter in that context in the way we're talking about. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate your time and um, the input that you make to the Fox and community. Thank you so much, and good luck with your deliberations. It's great as a right pad to know you're working hard till 8 o'clock tonight and tomorrow night. I wish you every success in your Thank deliberations. You. Thank you. Um, so we've now got our first change um, to the schedule because um, Mr. our second submitter is running 15 minutes late. So I'm going to ask Mr. Gerling, as the chair of the Foxton Community Board, uh, to come forward and present Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, our councillors, our officers, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you on behalf of the Tiawaha Foxton Community Board which is really on behalf of the largest, the second largest urban area of the Horofanua and an area that is really the jewel of the Horofanua. The rates review. While it's not perfect, the board supports option two. There will, of course, be ratepayers who will be disadvantaged with these changes, and it's understandable that their personal situation is relevant. A council document comments that rates should be made fairly and equitably across all ratepayers which is fair enough. It's a virtually impossible task, as one size does not fit all, and we are very much aware of that, and it's an approach which is frequently used by governments at all levels. One size does not fit all. The suggestions for reductions appear to target assets used by ratepayers, rather than the council looking very carefully at savings that could be made in operations, besides simply reducing mowing on the berms. It's noted that staff numbers seem to be on the increase, even though technology is supposed to reduce the human input. The very idea of reducing community grants is a slap in the face for many volunteers that keep our towns livable. This looks like a grab at the low-hanging fruit approach often taken by accountants. Reduce the marketing arm. It doesn't work. Okay, and perhaps the better focus is on the core business of council rather than spending so much on an economic development arm. It's appreciated that council funding is basically limited to rates. Councils need to work harder through local government New Zealand to get further source of income like a share of the regional GST. I think this is a very important factor for councils to work on very hard. You need more money for the job. Your work's in increasing but you're not getting any more money to do it with. 
the live-in landfill. The board supports option two, but also recommends the council looks forward to investigate properly the potential use of modern systems like pyrolysis. I've been involved in pyrolysis in China 20 years ago. Right, It does work and it works very well. There are drawbacks if it's done amateurly, but it can be done very professionally and reduce any form of emission. It's quite, an ex quite a successful system. It's been used very successfully overseas, not only for rubbish, but for the solid waste that comes from wastewater schemes. And that's another major problem in this area, right? The wastewater schemes take care of our, our effluents, but there's a lot of solid waste which needs to be disposed of. Pyrolysis can deal with that. Okay, we, need, we believe that attention needs to be paid to all existing landfills, not just the Levin landfill. The council are respectfully reminded that Foxton has current and historical landfill sites in need of urgent attention, as do other areas in the Horofanoa. It's not just Levin. Okay, water. The board supports option one, acknowledging that increasing pressure from the reality of climate change means major works need to be done sooner rather than later. It may be that past planning has not been as effective as it could be, but we do need to look to the future. Horford District Council is not the only organisation involved in the now amended Three Waters programme, but Foxton deserves a flood protection scheme as much as any other urban area does. Foxton does not even have a 50-year flood protection scheme. If it were not so serious, it would be laughable with the Prime Minister talking about 500-year flood protection schemes in New Zealand. Development contributions. Although some may not agree, it is completely reasonable that development contributions should be made where further council services are required. This includes water, roading and drainage. These contributions wind up eventually with the purchaser of the building or the houses that go on the development or the developed sites. Fox and Pools, tell how Fox and Community Boards continues to support the use of the 500k from the Fox and Beach Freeholding Fund, subject to consolation with an approval of the ratepayers of Fox and Beach. We also note that this amount will cause a breach under Section 81 of the existing policy. And we also note that the Fox and Beach Freeholding Fund is currently under review and nothing should be done until this review is complete. Thank you. Any questions for John? Council. Um, kia ora. I uh, have a question regarding the additional comments um, in the back of your submission. And and I'll read it because I, maybe I've just misunderstood. It says, um, perhaps there could be some accurate accounting for facilities such as Foxton Pool and any profit offset against the rates for Foxton and Foxton Beach. Are you, is that suggesting that Foxton Pool potentially makes a profit and then that portion is distributed amongst uh, I'm really asking them to see whether Fox and Pools does make a profit, and if it does make a profit, can that profit be applied to the to the rates of the Fox and area? Yes. Um, well, I hope so. But the um, financial forecasting we received was that it'd make a loss annually of three hundred thousand, and obviously we've been through that process. So, um, just yeah, profit would be nice, but um, so it kind of. Let's see. Um, the other thing, uh, I'd like to for you to expand more um, for your area around the community grants and 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 acknowledging all those voluntary organisations and how um, well you've you've said it, said it could lead to their elimination if they don't have that um, assistance. What kind of groups are you thinking of and that perhaps have received funding in the past or um, recently or even um, going forward? 
okay, there are several groups that I know of personally, right, and I'm quite possibly involved in. We have a Save Our River Trust, but I, we've got an arrangement going with those, which is very satisfactory and ongoing. Uh, we have a community garden, which depends entirely on on donations to get that going effectively. That garden has recently expanded. Um, that supplies food to the food banks, and the food banks are another area where, which are manned by volunteers who, who always need money. Um, these are the sort of groups that I'm talking about. Thank you, John. Uh, look, um, yeah, your, your statement around um, we need more money, um, obviously, you know, we wouldn't disagree with that. Um, there's always uh, things we have, and I know it's occupying the future of local government review uh, very much. The sustainable funding model for local government is top of mind for um, many districts around the country, and whether there's any movement on that, we'll just have to wait and see, but hopefully something will be done. Uh, and your request for GST um, is ongoing as it is every just about every year that I've been involved in local government, there's, you know, central governments need to actually share some of the, the taxes that they receive. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, and for also um, keep up good work with the Fox and Community Board and um, look forward to further um, work with you. Okay, councillors, so I, Levi Mildo Dove, is in the, so we're going back to our second uh, submitter, which is um, submission number 15, if you're using your folders, it's on page 79, or uh, the second uh, one, or page 6 of your hearing book. Welcome, Levi. Um, you have 10 minutes, so I assume you've read the the um, script that you got given uh, when you were, your timing was confirmed for today. Um, that, um, yeah, the 10 minutes includes question time, if any. So the floor is yours. Just turn the right button on. That's it. Cool. Sweet. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm here today to speak and voice my concern and objection in regards to the rates increase and the proposed changes in calculation from the land value to the capital value and the impact this will have on locals around the region. Today I'll speak on my own, about my own situation, but also stand for many who will be also affected in the same situation. My family and I are fortunate enough to have purchased rurally in Manuka, where we have raised our family, uh, running our family business, and are able to enjoy the quiet life away from the town centre. We don't have footpaths, we don't have street lighting, street lighting, bushwalks or playgrounds, nor do we get our booms mowed or have any form of stormwater drainage around us. For the most part, we really enjoy it, and our reliance on council is extremely minimal, which has always been reflected in the rates we contribute to council, which should be seen as a fair calculation, given the distance we are from the council-funded centres, uh, aquatics, libraries, playgrounds, etc. Now, while I'm completely aware costs are increasing, I struggle to get my head around and understand how fair it is that I, personally, are hit with a 17.1% increase in my rates due to the council-related costs increasing when the average is 79 across the region. Yes, I'm aware it is based on the recent RV um, being reviewed, which is just a number on a piece of paper given based on historic sales um, and demand for properties like mine, something which is you know, completely out of my control. The other piece I struggle with is, in turn, when you turn around and you say that it is completely fair to then change how the rates are calculated and hit me with an additional 14.1% increase to take my total rates increase to 33%. I'm here today to ask how. How is this fair? How is this fair in the environment that we're in, facing a cost of living crisis, when food costs are through the roof, power is set to increase, and the economy is on a knife edge of falling into a recession? The majority of rural properties, and I haven't done the stats on this, would be owner-occupied, and I'd say a high percentage of town centre houses are rentals. So under the change, landlords would get a fair deal. They'd get reduced rates uh, for not investing in their capital investment, but continue to, to cha charge the same rent, rent and then be pocketing the difference. Is it really fair that my elderly neighbours who have worked extremely hard all their life 
who own a nice property and have worked hard to do that, to then be expected to pay an additional 30% in rates from their fixed incomes being a pension. Is it fair that I now need to work extra hours each week to cover the proposed increase? With mortgage rates increasing as well, is it fair I get penalised because I decided to live rurally and ultimately have less dependence on council with less tangible things from council around me? It's disappointing to see that council are comfortable to pass on a 33% increase to a number of property owners and leave us high and dry to fend for ourselves without street lighting, paths, playgrounds and other town features. <coughs> It's also disappointing to understand council are comfortable to pass on these costs or these increases in a time when households are struggling to put food on the table. I ask that you take this, consider this submission into consideration for me, for my retired neighbours and others who are hard-working folk to enjoy the quiet life around Medicare. Thank you. Thank you, Levi. Councillor Jennings. Hey, Levi. Um, Thanks for reaching out to me during the consultation process as well. Like, and you know, you've done a huge amount of work engaging with others and a lot of research. Uh, and so, I just wanted to sort of do, address two things with you. Um, one, that this um, this change from land value to capital value has a significant impact on your household budget, and and and, and uh, you've you've talked mentioned yeah. that today. And so it can best be described as a sort of unwelcome, sudden shock that will have a big impact on your particular household. So if you can confirm that. Yes, that is correct, yes. And then the other thing is that um, I think during the consultation process, I saw that you did some engagement on social media through Facebook and did, ran a bit of a poll um, uh, uh, and to, to gauge other people's um, thoughts. And I wonder if you just wanted to flag what the results of that were. Was. Yeah, sure. So yes, I did. I posted it on social media, trying to get some some engagement uh, from other local community members. And yes, the you know, a lot of people weren't aware of what was actually happening, what was involved in the in, in the rates itself. But there was a lot of people that were shocked to see that their rates were increasing under this proposal. Um, yeah, I spoke to a number of people in our street who were also concerned that their rates were going to be increasing by a large portion, um, and. Yeah, it, it, it was it, it sent quite a frenzy through the community, I'd say. Um, so yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, Levi, can I ask? I mean, council did send a letter to every rate payer in the district, advising them of the changes that might be occurring uh, with their rates. Did these people not see? Or... Yeah, they they probably did. I, I'm not too sure, but they um, right. they weren't aware. Yeah, they 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 voiced their concern, I suppose, on social media. That they yeah you know, easy to do yeah um yeah I th and look you're not alone in the, in the submission that you're making in terms of the impact that this will have on um, thing I I find it um, interesting that you know we as a council because we engage with our community we ask them their feelings and think uh, their opinions and views on this that we get caught for the the cost of living increases the 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 banks. Uh, for their mortgage rates increases, because I'm sure if anyone went to their bank and said, oh, well, I can't afford this, uh, the banks wouldn't um, have anything, but um, so what? Um, you know, it's just, I just, you know, I, I suppose I'm being a little facetious in terms of that argument, but, you know, it's interesting that council is the one that often gets the blame for uh, any increases in costs, whereas everybody else just puts them up anyway and just expects their customers to pay for those uh, sorts of uh, services. So, look, uh, completely acknowledge what you're saying, and uh, obviously um, there are a number of submissions that we've received along the same lines and will cause uh, plenty of discussion and debate as we move towards deliberations on this matter. Uh, I think you made a good point there, um, that they speak of their customers. Yeah. Well, we're not customers of council. Sure. I think that's the that's the difference. Okay, I, I, well, you know, we can have this debate uh, some further that's stage. Fine. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. But thank you. All right. Any other further questions for uh, Levi? Uh, Levi, um, thank you. We engaged as well, um, similar to Councillor Jennings, in relation to. Um, the matter. I'd really like for you to potentially share your, your view around 
I guess our interaction that we had where I spoke about one of the factors, considerations for me wasn't a percentage increase, um, but actually a relative looking at your rates relative to to total household income, which is essentially where we're trying to look to deliver a much fairer cost and, and what your response what you know, was to that argument, because I think that would be quite useful to, to the fuller council table to understand your view around that. I can't remember what my reply was to that. Um, but yeah, while I understand that, yes, it, is, it should be relative to income, um, yeah, I think um, it also needs to be relative to the environment that we're in. So, you know, um, whacking a 33% increase in one go is a massive increase, and I don't think anyone should have to bear that um, on their shoulders. That's, you know, for me, that's over $600. Um, it's so, so what I'm hearing from that, from, from my end, is that, one, um, the the minimal amount of services you receive from council as a rule is one consideration. And for two, it's not necessarily the increase, it's the timing of the increase. Yeah, it, it is partly that. It is a whole. Yep. It is partly that, but then also the the increase is, is um, yeah, the increase of the whole is just, yeah, I'm saying um, at 30, 33%, I think it was. So, yeah, if it was broken down into over, over a number of years and it was built up to that, then, uh, yeah, um, that, that may be okay. But I, I still think the point around um, town centre properties being uh, rentals versus... Um, yeah, you know, rural properties being rentals, um, yeah, you know, landlords are going to be taking the, just pocketing the difference here. Um, what we're doing is, yeah, keeping them afloat. Thank you, Levi. I do appreciate the fact that you've bothered to, um, you know, write a full and, and uh, you know, good tran uh, transparent um, submission. And look, we certainly take note of what you've said. Thank you. Thank you. So our next submitter we're going to hear from is uh, Eugene Hanare. Uh, Eugene's uh, submission is number 390, um, which is page 1942, or in your hearing book, page 24. Kia ora, Eugene. Welcome. So, Eugene, I just want to remind you that you do only have 10 minutes. Um, and if you could turn the right hand button on on both of them, maybe. Um, does that one go as well? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for having the opportunity to come and explain who we are. We are next door neighbours. We're the first inhabitants of this area, actually. Goes back since time of war. Um, we have some uh, statutory memorial arrangements with the Crown, um, with fishing rights, and also uh, our um, cultural practices. Um, they are engaged in, um, um, in acts that uh, through Parliament, and we uh, we in, uh, practice them and uphold them. So it's just letting you. Um, elected, um, uh, elected um, council members, um, who we are. Your role is you're obligated 
um, to um, help us out, you know, and, and uh, uphold our, our, our um, legislative rights, um, as well as we uh, um, are obligated to uh, help you out as well. The area that we are, um, and have, have, um, have our activity of uh, landfill was um, a 30, maybe 40 year process. So I've been involved with it right from the start, about 30 or 40 years. In the 1980s, maybe up to 2002, we were made an application in the environmental court to um, seek a way forward of participation. And the participation was through uh, an, an um, established group directed by the environmental courts or um, of a community group like a liaison group, owners of the neighbouring properties and have interest to parties who had. Uh, not only uh, uh, a cultural invest, uh, interest in it, but also um, the environmental interest and in keeping the whole community nice, safe in the environment um, and a good, uh, safe uh, uh, state. But we we knew um, way back in uh, 1980 that we had to um, object to the, to the activity. There's, we still object to it today. It's not in the right place, it's right outside of the, the center square we're talking about where this uh, jigsaw was put in. And uh, so, um, our media um, concerns is that um, they've not been able to provide, um, you know, um, my grandfather was the chief of, of his family and his, uh, and his people, and he fed the people by catching tuna and other species of fish on our part, you know, which is straight across the road from the landfill. So that part you know, has been a provision and provided for us and sustain us for the time and work. Uh, we have a, an, um, an agreement, um, a legislative act agreement to uphold that. So I'm upholding that legislative act um, and we're, we're, I'm wanting to inform you that you're responsible and obligated um, uh, to uh, um, us as, um, um, as a neighbour and of course, for us as a partner, because um, we're just not your neighbour as well. We're, we're, we're a partner in um, the, all of our um, environmental uh, um, resources that we uh, that we've been um, practicing and upholding for a long time. So it's a part of us. We're still here today. We'll still be here in another thirty years. Hopefully, with this um, issue and the agenda of the, of the discussion board. And put back to where it was. Um, there's a lot of um, serious decision making that need to be made, and that done um, obviously with these ones here. Um, I, I first became the first commission hearings um, where there were commissioners, and they were experts, commissioners, of course, having uh, legal and um, educational doctrines um, um, that um, you know, followed them. So when we're talking to um, expert, expert people. And these people um, today, uh, they knew what, what, what was written on the paper, uh, how it was going to work. Um, of course, there was a lot of those things that didn't actually go to the plan, as we know now. Um, so those things that didn't go to the plan, um, we're having to uh, have a liability over them and to understand what happened, how we can remedy it uh, and mitigate that uh, plan and overlay it with something that, uh, that will replace it, uh, with something that will work, that is more friendly user, and rather than the, um, the business case that we had um, overlapping uh, that actual um, project in that area. So we're, um, we're happy to uh, to work with council as, uh, as long um, um, occupants of uh, pieces of land over a couple of hundred hectares of land. On both sides, both the Queen Strip side as well as the South side, and it's the South side that we have uh, a partition a block out uh, that was uh, set up for Partina, which is a fishing easement, and it was just for, for my grandfather's and his family. And now I find myself having to uh, uh, um, administrate that on all my loved ones before me. Uh, I hope that I can do a good job, and I plan to, which I mean to succeed, and uh, to get a good resolution 
of wisdom together. Uh, for for all the answers of war. Now my grandfather went like I said, when the first of all for all of us, uh, and gave it to everybody. First our old people and then the community got all of us given them. Um, I currently have hundred and nine um, beneficiaries on my owner's list. So I'm going to, going to go and find this for 109 people. Can't trying to come down to the quantum of having to replace as the fish there now, today. Because that's the guarantee that I have as the long uh, uh, and uh, the manager and organizer of that uh, responsibility. So I'm going to ensure that 109 beneficiaries get fish every week. Um, as my grandfather used to go. I used to be, we were all cut from the seeing all the eels on the line and all that, and wrapping up on our parcels and giving it to the community. It's family, it's people, it's easy. And um, he was providing it. And that part of the fishing um, platform still maintains its um, place today. It's uh, still a physical place. We still have a title on it. Uh, we don't, um, don't seem to be able to. Uh, uh, provide the, um, any resource involvement because it's been terribly um, um, neglected and some points where that's been out of our control. So um, that, that control is I think that we can pull it all up, uh, pull it back in together and just uh, try and fix it up because it's right out of control. Um, yeah, some of the options you got on here today, um, Alice is still maintained by the line. Learn that up the facility over. Let's, let's stop wasting money there. Let's start looking at that now. The old uh, land pool, so I'm really getting through on, on the old land pool because it's, it's um, you know, it needs desperate repair and it's sledging. And a lot of brothers are there. We already knew this from 30 years ago when, when we um, objected then. We, we had our objections. They were hit. They were hit by these educated commissioners. They weren't just bringing elected uh, council members, um, and they um, they actually uh, made a decision based on science, and we believe them because they know all the education. Right? But uh, the science actually messed like, a couple of buckets or dots. The dots didn't line up, and uh, unfortunately, the accountability or, or accountability of the, the project and the plan was wasn't um, resolved as good as what it could be. So here we are making the decision about the landfill, and of course um, the community is represented by Hobbit and this council. You are the responsible people on, on my bar, because I'm a right bar. My parents have been for over 60 years, or 70 years. I've been right bar for nearly 50. So I'm um, not only um, an owner of the neighbouring property, of the property that I've been invested 40 years on as well. Um, and as you can see, uh, the frustration I have is my, my councilman um, projects and uh, is actually going up against my own um, titleship uh, that was passed down to me in Kinsa. Um, so um, I just hope that that explanation to you has um, allowed you, you can, get, you can get a lot more other stuff um, about the, the, the stream, the, the land, where the, the land uh, land was on, it's actually a place called uh, the Fano Pali. We across the region we have an uh, area out there called Kolmokare, which is the hundred um, parallel chiefs who are buried in the sand of our property. So those Fano Pali are another aspect of um, law on the landfill side, as well as on the Port Tawa. It was um, beautifully uh, recognised as a public place of putting rubbish because they had a lot of galleys. And those galleys to uh, a uh, land for a land for a long Eugene. Yeah, that could be filled in. But that is ten minutes. If, you, would, if you wouldn't mind just wrapping it up. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's people coming in. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, hopefully um, I've been able to share the my involvement here. I'm the chairman of the trust. I'm going to get it just now. Um, so I've got the responsibility to uh, act for the betterment of the 109 beneficiaries uh, on, my, on our urgent um, land titles and tenure. And that includes the Mahukia stream as well.
Um, so, um, good luck in the situation. I think the community's made the decision already, and it's just dialing over um, you know, what's the best business plan we want. So, hopefully, we can um, recognise some of the areas that have been in the clean up. It'd probably be best used for um, a scenic preserve or something preserve that we can uh, fire out, vents, and all that stuff, sort of stuff, um, and make it into a more environmental purpose rather than a. Um, a cash cow of uh, rubbish. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jane, I really appreciate the fact that really? you and John uh, and uh, of your trust have turned up today. Yeah. Look, we we do value your uh, views and opinions, and obviously we'll be taking much consideration of those uh, as we deliberate uh, going into uh, in the next few weeks. So, uh, yeah. So, do you have any questions? Uh, put it on my. Bye, no, I think we've got it at the moment. Thank you. All right. Well, that's been enough for you to um, forge a view, a form of view of uh, who I am, who we are, the names, and uh, who you are. And you're a yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Yeah, let's go now. Yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just councillors, please note that um, Mr. Warren is unwell today and unable to um, be here. Um, so, we will now move to um, Chris Hartwell, which is submission 125 on page 670 or on page 25 of your hearing book. Welcome, Chris. Um, just middle seat and right hand button of your, um, you'll um, be aware of the uh, the instructions that we issued you uh, before your appearance today, I'm assuming. Instructions around um, the, the advice, if you like, not instructions, around the timing and um, just the way that we operate. Yes, yeah, so I'm well, well aware of the timing. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All yours. One of the things I'd like to talk about is obviously rates increases, um, and with us facing sort of seventeen point nine percent increase, um, it's pretty hard in these economic uh, conditions to um, to sort of survive with that. Um, one of the key things um, for me is uh, we run a small agricultural contracting business, and we do a, a lot of hay. Um, Back a number of years ago, when the council, in my view, was a little bit more fiscally responsible, uh, they went through a program of um, minimising the amount of mowing that was going on across the district. Uh, we actually tended the first year for that work uh, and picked up the mowing of a number of uh, the uh, parks and reserves. And the second year, uh, the contract was sort of renegotiated. Uh, and in the council's view, they were saving in a in excess of $100,000 a year in mowing costs, and they were quite happy to um, give us a grasp for nothing. So under that contract, we were uh, mowing the parks and reserves uh, twice a year, taking that for hay, and saving somewhere circa, circa sort of 100 grand a year. Um, that idea has actually taken off in other councils. Uh, just um, recently, 2021, Wanganui City Council um, has trialled um, a one-year low-mow scenario. 
um, where they have um, uh, Tamana Park in Eremo, Bastion Hill, Watertown, and Montgomery Road uh, parks I don't know anymore. They do it twice a year. Uh, Auckland are doing the same. Uh, so what I'd suggest to the council as part of my submission is let's look at doing a similar sort of thing and take a, a bit more cost out of mine parks and reserves. Any questions? Any questions? Hi there, thank you for your submission. On um, the back page under additional comments, you mentioned looking at how we control the representation costs and oh, Oh, and um, we did have a section around how we think, or options around how we think we could um, get an average rate less than 7.9. Um, and then it was there was a opportunity to add other ideas. Is is this essentially one of those? And of course, the one you just shared. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, for us, our. Uh, Representation costs and our rates have gone up 27.9% this year if it goes through. Um, and it's a significant increase. Uh, you know, it's, it's not 7.9. You know, it, it's ballooned out quite significantly. And I sort of look at it and say, hey, what are the council doing to control some of those costs? Um, you know, there are a lot of people around here, a lot of people in senior management, and there's a lot of cost involved in running the council. Um, and, and it's just one area that seems to be a little bit out of step with, you know, other areas that have increased for us personally anyhow. Chris, it's interesting that you use uh, percentages, but when we actually translate these into dollars, you know, the, they, are, they are off a relatively low base in terms of our rates are, in terms of operating expenses, are the third lowest in the country. Um, so, you know, we've got to temper some of those um, sort of comments around just get rid of senior staff or get rid of, you know, cut costs here and there with, you know, we, we do operate a fairly tight ship already. But I guess in, uh, in addition to that, we also have lump with horizons rates as well. So the rates uh, picture is somewhat distorted because of that, uh, whereas other areas may not have that same level of, um, yeah, sort of, it's almost two sets of rates. Um, all rate payers within the country would be paying a regional rate as well as their district rate. Yeah. I'm not quite sure as to how that compares with Horizons. Yeah, it would be interesting to do that. So. Uh, again, we're the ones that need to pull our horns in so that we can have Horizons get what they want. Um, you know, there needs to be some balance there. And obviously, um, if we don't rate right across the district evenly, uh, then someone's got to pay for it in the end. And, I mean, that's the challenge that we have. They just say, you know, we're also going to be faced, uh, you know, at some point in the future where the cost of, uh, of financing uh, a lot of projects within the, the area uh, will increase quite significantly. So it's going to add, you know, further burden to uh, to the ratepayers. And, and I guess it's one of those things of it's easy to start, uh, you know, reining things in early than to be at the point where, you know, you sort of tipped over the, the edge of the cliff. Could I ask you then, in terms of the rate of inflation at the moment being around 7%, do you think our rates increases relative to that? I know a lot of our neighbours are double digits and, and even more, um, that you know we're all struggling to with those household costs as well. Yeah, well, for us personally, ours is 17.9% increase. <laughs> We're another 10% above your average, Bernie. Um, look, 
one one of the points around option one keeping it the same and, and moving um, to option two is is around really looking at the spread of percentage of rates to household income and the idea being trying to keep household income to you know, five percent. Um, yeah, I'm and in a rural um, definition, consider taking that into consideration. My question to you, given that you're living rural, um, you're contracting, do you claim your portion of rates as an expense for your business or farm? We do claim for that. However, this year, if you looked at our contracting uh, income, uh, we made $24,700. So it ain't been a good year. Uh, and if you look at it, uh, the rates bill as a percentage, it's pretty significant. Councillor Bradigan. Yeah, just quickly, Chris, um, think just in terms of your, uh, your comments around the park mowing, etc. Um, and I don't know the examples you've used, but if you look at the consult consultation document, um, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to put across through those reserves, but um, in terms of, and I'll use Fox and Victoria Park as a, as a main example, um, that's the northernmost entrance to, to our community at a time where in this district we're, we're trying to attract tourism and, and, and grow GDP and get people spending money back in our communities. What would that look like if it was only mowed once a year? I guess there are a number of other councils around the countryside who are embarking on the same thing. They're doing it, A, from an environmental perspective and say, hey, there are some environmental benefits uh, from doing that. Uh, in some areas, it's helping restore some of the uh, local you know, flora and fauna, uh, etc. So there's always trade-offs. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate your time and the uh, amount of work that you went into preparing your submission. Um, it is noted and will be, you know, along with everyone else's, uh, considered as we move into our deliberations over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Cheers. Can I welcome uh, Carol to the table? So the right hand button, Carol, on the um, microphone in front of you, uh, we'll turn a little red light on, that means you're set to go. Welcome, it's all yours. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to come and talk to my submission, which relates to the requirement of water tanks for all new dwellings in the Horofanoa area which have access to the district's water supply. I don't need to tell you the benefits of saving water or minimising loss in households in the district, on the district water supply, but I have discovered that Council has made available to residents at cost emergency rainwater tanks, 200 litres. These need to be promoted much more in view of climate change and the restrictions on our water supply during dry periods. I asked my husband this morning when I was looking at this, did he know about these? No, he didn't, and neither did I. So you need to do some more work on these emergency tanks because I think that is very commendable, that they are available at $120 each, I think, for 200 litres. I presume you all know that you did have that? My plea to Council is to mandate rainwater and or grey, grey water tanks for all new builds in the area that would be on our district water supply. This would have an impact on added costs, but as Brand's surveys show, there are cost savings and environmental benefits, and I'm not going into the ifs and buts and disadvantages and all the rest of it because it's quite a huge topic. The other point concerning the installation of 
I presume underground tanks, but I know that some are installed on bigger properties at the back of the property, is the costs of resource consent fees, and these need to be minimal. Several years ago, a friend of mine in Otaki, and I know that is Capity Council, decided that a rainwater tank at the back of the house would be an advantage and help them save water. When she asked about the resource consent fees needed, they were $2,000. And she just said, we can't afford that. So, if Capity and Auckland councils can mandate water rainwater and grey water tanks, why can't Horofanoa? I was actually asked by a councillor to put this submission in, which is why I've done it. So please, would you consider this in the long term plan and sooner rather than later? Water meters are a different issue. They're known to reduce water use, but council needs to consider the ongoing costs to households if and when these are promulgated, instigated. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Um, look, in the initial response that officers have given us, um, they do refer to the fact that um, all the properties in Tarareka will be um, required on those properties. So we are endeavouring to institute that as we move through different district plan changes and um, you know, the future growth uh, of the district. Um, we know that, um, yeah, look, it's probably a, an issue that we need to uh, consider, especially for next year's long-term plan. Um, I'm surprised that Peter didn't know about those emergency no. water tanks because he's at a number of council meetings which I attend, um, and uh, I'm sure that would have been spoken about oh, uh, a, a number of times. Um, and I will be passing on uh, to the Mayor of Kapiti around their consent charges and making sure that ours are uh, uh, a lot less in terms of if people want to install that as well. But um, I just, has any other councillors got any questions or? The costs in Kapiti may well have changed since then. Right. I've okay. no idea what they are. I okay. didn't have time to actually have a look, but she was aghast at the time. Right. And as a lower income family, they just there was just no suggestion of paying for it, which I thought was an absolute shame because she was interested in putting in um, water tanks. I happened to talk to a friend in Auckland yesterday, and they're in a relatively new build. Um, they have grey water tanks, which is used for the toilet. <laughs> I'm sure there will be questions asked of our officers in terms of consenting costs uh, for, right, uh, for water tanks um, as well uh, in, over the next few weeks as well. Um, look, thank you very much uh, for your attendance and uh, the fact that you've um, uh, submitted on this. Um, yeah, look, it's great to see your engagement and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Cheers, Carol. Actually, believe it or not, running slightly ahead of time. Um, someone we've not really seen uh, over time, but Charles Rudd, is he in the building? No. no. Uh, Welcome, Charles. Here am I, here am I, here am I. Peter, here am I. Oh, hello, Minnie Cow, I live in North Hey, Tata, I care, Tata, I'm queen, you know, I'm talking about. I'm going to give you all some bubble of messages, okay? Because <laughs> I am an enigma. <laughs> if you know what that means. So, oh, in amongst all this stuff is my submission. Okay. 
Uh, <coughs> where the hell are we going? <coughs> Governors, we vote, uh, we the people vote for you on our behalf to use your intellect, knowledge and wisdom. We did not vote for the operations personnel or for consultants. So look at your, uh, your individual selves in the mirror of wisdom in your deliberations. I'm talking to your governance people. Okay? Uh, my passive assertive, assertive aggressive name is Charlie Horse. Uh, where can you lead a horse to water? Where you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot lead me sexually. Okay? There are, therefore, I invite you of governors to ask me questions within my submission. Kia ora So it's only got five minutes or whatever, so you can start asking questions to my submission. Anyone? I'm still recovering, Charles. Um, <laughs> Old Charles and then we um, get some oil. Great to see you, Charles. Okay. Really glad you've come along. Is um, that you? Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> I always enjoy your presence here. Uh, good to see that you've checked option one for the landfill. All right. In regards to option two, which you haven't checked, yes. Could you speak on your feelings on, on any other alternate uses of the site? Are you, you talking about uh, landfill? Black or white. Right. If you go for option two or three, you're going to still pollute the, uh, uh, the environment of the odour issues and leachate heavy metals into the Hokkaido stream. If you use grass clippings and all that, they break down because they've got heavy metals. You don't know what's in that grass clippings and stuff like that. And what are you going to put out there? I mean, commercial or other stuff and all the rest of it? No. To me, I mean, um, the English word has been bastardised of, of things like when they say, uh, we uh, consult with you. Consult used to mean engagement. It doesn't now. It's the same as some of these words. Oh, closure. What does actually closure mean in the English dictionary compared to what is said here of closure? Three points of different ways of closure. Come on. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I'm happy with that answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell me how Tina Kui Matua Charles. It is it is good to see your presence here as, as I've seen over many years. <laughs> You've been a real advocate for, for the Fenua. Uh, I just really wanted to resonate with um Councillor Boyle's question actually around future use. I don't think we actually got got an answer around that for you in terms of what is potential use um that, that you as as our Māori community would see it. Yeah. Well, I've made an official complaint uh, uh, to the Living Landfill because they're, they're talking about, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, the MTA and some archaeological people going out there on the site sort of thing. So I've made an official complaint. And in that official complaint, it will tell you who I am and why I'm on that landfill. And I've been on that landfill since 1995, right? I've closed three other landfills here in the Hofferia district, and I went to the fourth one, which was this one. That used to be a mobile pass site. And around that site is um, uh, four Uripa, four cemeteries. And I'm a uh, sentinel for all these kinds of things, Wahi Tapu, Tapu Tapu areas and that. And it's for me to be there, and it, it was an insult to me that the MTA, which is supposed to look after social issues, not funeral issues, right, that they, they have not been involved in issues of the landfill, things like that, at all. And all of a sudden, when it comes to Wahi Tapu areas like wooden sites and all that, then when someone from this council decide, oh, we'll get the MTA and an archaeological person to go there. I call archaeological people grave diggers, mate. That's what I call them. Uh, I've been out there with the council before when uh, they struck wooden sites and... Uh, I went out with regional council, district council before, and then um, and they, the land was flat, and you see all uh, the puppy shells and all that. And we're looking at it, and I said, "What do you people see?" 
And they said, oh, I just shelled. And I said, did you see that little green speck? And they said, oh, yes, plastic green. And I said, no, I haven't touched it. Walked over, picked it up, and I said, that's bone in a little bit. And then later on, he had Mara Kupa, Matakati, and Robert Warrington start to walk over the fender you know, where the inside was. And I said, what are you fellas doing? He said, oh, we're trying to look for artifacts. I said, you just passed one. They said, where? I said, behind you. And they, and they said, where? So I picked it up and I said, look at it. It looked like a stone, but when we turned it over, it was shined by man. They didn't know what they were looking for. I'm the only one from Mopa who knows these sort of things. Yeah, but that is why uh, I'm on that land for. I hope that's answered your question. Mightn't have. Sorry. Thank you, Charles. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Charles, as always. It's always a pleasure to receive you. Um, and thank you for those subliminal messages that you gave us. Um, and, and your, um, oh, yeah, your I've had display. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Much respect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, we're now moving on to uh, a similar Tony Strawbridge, uh, which is 155, 156, 157 and 158, um, page 814 of your uh, submission book or 39 of your hearings book. Welcome, Tony. Good afternoon. Thank you. Do I press this? Okay. So, um, yes, I'm here to do, to talk about overgrown footpaths along with boundary creek. Okay. So my submission is if you're not able to walk in front of your road boundary without obstruction, you have boundary creep. And having to use the grass burn to avoid overgrown foliage, this affects walkers as well as people in wheelchairs, mobility scooters, children going to school, Caregivers with prams and push chairs. Put yourself in the picture with any of these situations. Some residents have already maintained their area in front of their boundary in good condition, but some plant up with agapanthus, lavenders, rosemary plants, and then others leave them to become overgrown. I would ask that with um, issues that we have of maintenance outside people's road boundaries, that in the long-term plan we need something, and there could be something there as a bylaw or something, that people have to maintain those in front of their properties. They need to be able to walk in front of their properties without obstruction. Tony, do you have specific examples of, are you talking about your own, around your own area, specifically? Sorry, I do have lots of examples all over Levin. Um, and I'm sure all of you people have walked some property, walked the footpaths and you run into obstructions. I did send in some photographs um, that were, and I'm not sure if you have copies of those of just some examples. Because that was my next question. You have you have uh, advised council of some of those areas uh, where there is obstruction, uh, because it does require members of the community to let us know where uh, those are before we can really act on it. Yes, I have, um, and in fact, I've got a. I just received yesterday an email because I have spoken to Mike and Chris, I think it is, um, as in the, the talk in the library, 
to meet a counsellor and I've got a, a CRM number for an outstanding one. But I don't want to be a Cameron in this example all the time, but it's an ongoing issue. Yep. And somehow we need to put something out to rate payers that this is really not acceptable. Councillor yeah. Grimsley. Yeah, but Bernie, the, in that couple of the councillor, Tony identified two or three sites. So those two or three sites will be captured within that case management, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm glad, Tony, that the process works and that we, you've been it up with some feedback around what Council um, is doing about that too. Councillor James. Yeah, Tony, can I just check, are you, are you seeking, um, are you happy with sort of the current reactive approach where residents are reporting in these things and then they, they get dealt with? Or are you advocating through your submission for Council to take a more proactive approach to this? I just, I just want to really understand, are you, are you happy with the sort of current approach where councils identifying some stuff proactively but also relying on residents' reports or are you looking for something different? I am looking for something different because we've had overgrown footpaths for infinitum and it doesn't improve. In fact, it's getting worse. So I'd like council to put something in long term that even if it goes out to the with the rates um, demand, even if it's on via email, that people are reminded that if you cannot walk in your in front of your road boundary, you need to do something about it. It's your responsibility. And the fact that we have boundary creep, we have people building right out to the footpath these days with their fence line. So the Toby's inside the, their fence. The um, telecommunications inside the fence. And with council looking at rating those road booms, this is going to become more of a problem. Thank you. Sorry, you just made a comment there, rating our road booms. I don't follow that one, sorry. Is the council looking to stop mowing the road booms and as a proposal and having residents look after the road booms for the future to save on costs? I think it might be able to answer. Well, yes, um, I was just going to bring it up with you because your concerns um, are valid and you'll see on that, or you obviously saw one of the proposals in the long-term plan amendment consultation document is for council to stop um, mowing urban booms, so roadside booms. So given what you're saying, um, and this is a, a significant drop in levels of service, so I take it your reaction to that would be pretty... Um, um, was the word I'm looking for. So you'd have a pretty hard reaction to that, I would imagine, because it's only going to make what you're putting out worse. And the other point I'd make is that the road boom, the urban boom, and the, and the road booms are actually council property. Council actually own not the, not the residents. So so while we have a, probably a more people have a you know, moral responsibility right in the front of your place to look tidy, um, a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't, and a lot of people can't. So your reaction to that? My reaction to that is if you're a ratepayer and um, you have to keep in front of your property clean and tidy. And I think we've got examples around the country where people are growing veggies out on the road burn and, and that's fine, but they often get overgrown and just left. So how is the council going to propose to enforce that? Tidy road booms, and I put it back to you. So, I thought, yeah. So, so what, I, what I'd probably suggest is council can't can't enforce that, but what council could do is stop mowing the booms, like the proposal says. But of course, there's going to be a there's going to be a, a a result of that, isn't there? It's going to look pretty damn untidy. So, the concerns you have um, will be a hell of a lot worse if that happens. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Look, appreciate your time and um, for bringing the issue to uh, in front of us. Um, and look, I'm sure that if you don't get a satisfactory response, that you will continue to, um, you know, ensure that we get some feedback from you and uh, whether we're doing a good job or not. Because I mean, we're all councillors. We all, most of us own. Um, 
residences within the district and we want to ensure that uh, we continue to uh, provide a, a safe and, and uh, enjoyable uh, place for all our residents. So, yeah, look, I appreciate the time and, and the effort that you've done in, in making this uh, an issue. Christine, welcome. It's only been um, six months, Christine. Didn't expect to see you back quite so quickly. <laughs> no, I didn't expect to be back quickly, actually. <coughs> but, so I apologise for that. It's eight months, I think. Okay, so good afternoon, Mr Mayor, councillors and staff. I'm presenting this submission on behalf of myself and my husband, Bruce. I'll be commenting on issue one, a rates review for a fairer distribution of rates. We support option one, keep the status quo for now. This is not the right time for a rating policy change. We explained fairly clearly in our written submission why we are taking this stance. It's not because we have a philosophical stance about capital value versus land value. As a past councillor, I do understand the arguments for a capital value-based general rate, but at this stage, we believe the status quo is the right option to choose. Today, I will expand on two of the reasons given in our written submission. One, information flaws. Data and a map have been produced by staff in an attempt to show the general public the percentage of household income spent on rates. We're told on page 17 of the consultation document that fixed charges make up about 60% of the rate take. This is because you have included wastewater and water supply service charges in your calculations. Take the 2023-24 proposed charges of 5,487,000 sorry, 5.487 million for water supply and 7.578 million for sewage off, that's about 13 million, and the percentage of income paid is much lower. Therefore, the information given is misleading. We can't believe that a document went out for public consultation where rates paid by households who receive the services of sewage and drinking water are compared with households who fund these activities themselves. 1,167.54 needs to come off a property with both of those services supplied. The urban stormwater rate, say $160 for an average house, also needs to come off. So now you can compare rates with households that don't receive these services. What would the percentage figures and the coloured map look like now? Another area of mis misinformation which concerns us is the lack of information about options one and three. We have been told what our rates would look like under the proposed option, option two. We were sent letters with, with this information and the information is published on the rating database on Council's website, but there are no projected figures for options one or three for comparison. The two major flaws in the information given during consultation smack of predetermination to us. These two flaws alone should be enough for you to put this rating policy change on hold. We also have questions about how the incomes compared with rates may have been arrived at. Is it gross salary before tax or income after tax? Does the income include government subsidies such as working for families or accommodation supplements? Number two, affordability and this time for farmers. Our farm runs sheep and beef. It's not an intensive operation as this type of operation would not suit our land. In our written submission we supplied you with the percentage of income spent on rates that our farms earn before tax. We did include Horizons rates in our calculations because farms pay a lot more to the regional council than urban properties. Our farm in Levin pays $2,514 to Horizons. $913 of that is towards flood protection for properties downstream of us. This is pertinent because this is a stormwater rate for rural. However, we recalculated the percentage of our HDC rates only compared with total income, 
and found that our households still paid an average of over 10% of our income before tax to HDC over four years. In the consultation document, we are told that it should not be over 5%. Farmers contributed around 25% of the general rate this financial year. Statistics New Zealand tell us that there were only 468 farms and horticultural businesses in the Horofenua district in 2021 and 2022. They know this because every year, primary production businesses are required by law to fill in a comprehensive survey. Primary production businesses are generally family businesses, and the number of these businesses had fallen from 636 in 2011 that's 168 fewer farming, family farming businesses in just 10 years. Some farming businesses may have grown, but an awful lot of farms have been taken out by rural lifestyle and residential blocks. When you drive around the Horofenua, most of those houses you see don't belong to farmers. So why are 468 farming families paying such a big share of the general rate? Shouldn't the percentage be lower to reflect the proportion of farmers in our district? We appreciate that option three gives a farming differential of 20%, but I understand that there is no scientific data-based reasoning behind this figure. There needs to be more work done on the affordability of rates for farming families before the rating policy is changed. And that can't happen now because it has not gone out as an option. There are only three options that you can choose from. If council is really serious about rates being affordable for most of us, you need to reevaluate your role. It's not about being a grandparent who provides all of the goodies. It's about providing what we need in a cost-effective manner so that we can get on and help ourselves. Now, some of you have only been here since October for less than eight months. As an ex-councillor, I know that there is an awful lot to get your head around when you get on to council. A landfill, development contributions, and a change to the rating system, all in your first eight months. Yep. Do you fully understand the present rating system? Do you have a good understanding of the diverse range of communities in the Horofenua district? and how people and businesses in those communities will be affected by this proposed change from land value to capital value. We urge you to put this rating policy change on hold until New Zealand's economy settles down and until you have a much better understanding of your communities and of options that address affordability issues right across the district. I'm not sure whether people would be too scared to ask you questions, Chris, because um, you probably know more than them, um, and certainly um, more than us or me uh, in particular. Um, uh, can I just thank you, first of all, for your um, detail, your logic, and your, the way you've articulated that. Um, obviously, you know, that's going to, we've got some pretty heavy um, discussions and debate ahead of us over the next um, month or so. Um, but yeah, I like, really appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this, and I know that you would have done that um, very assiduously and um, diligently. So yeah, I appreciate that. Deputy Mayor Allen, look, I echo the Mayor's words. Thank you very much to you and Bruce for the very thoughtful submission, Christine. Could I just understand, I get the feel from your submission, but I just want to put it to you that in principle you're not opposed to capital value or move to capital value, but it's about understanding better the impacts and also factoring in what you see as being some erroneous information informing the suggestion at the present moment? Yes, definitely. So it's, it's, it's the timing, really. And if we're going to change the rating system, it has to be done once and it has to be done right. And just the fact that New Zealand is in a huge pickle to start with at the moment is not a good time. Plus, I don't think you've got the information right. And if you've given information to the general public to submit on, which is not really kosher, then I don't think you've got the right to change policy until you've gone out and actually given that information and given people a chance to come back to you. Councillor 
my question. Um, in your written submission, um, you mention the dog fees, the working dog, and um, I can't assume you're a, a member of Federated Farmers, but in, they also highlight um, the point about the first dog and then the subsequent dog, and the, they've given um, comparisons between Carterton, Marsden, and Tararua, what we're proposing and what they do. Um, for example, $70 for the first two dogs in Carterton and then they're $36 after that. Is that, are you, are you, because you don't specifically give a number, so are you, is that kind of what you're, you're after? Yeah, kind of. When I was on council, I didn't want to make plaques for farmers. I tried to sort of be a councillor for everybody, so I never brought this up before, but I always knew that as farmers, we paid far more towards dogs than anybody else because of our land value. So something, you know, farmers are already paying more than anyone else, so why should they pay more now? A, a bit less would be good. Thank you. And I am a member of Federated Farmers. And of course, one of the other things that you mention is the roof of the Foxton Pool. It's not a new roof, but it's just fixing the old one. Um, because we built um, a dog, if you like, and now we're having to fix it to make sure it is usable again. Um, so just assuring it's not a nice to have, this is, we have to fix this. Yeah, that, that's a matter of opinion. And when I was on council, I voted against that because yep. I think that the amount to do it was ridiculous and I'm sure it could be done cheaper. Councillor <laughs> Grimston. <laughs> Uh, look again. You're not, you're not done yet. Yeah, I, I echo again. I, I really like the the points that you raise. Um, yeah, I I I don't necessarily accept the argument over the inaccurate income piece. Um, I think that yeah, it's been through order. It's landed it close enough. But my question to you really is: what I heard was, if not now, when? And given your understanding of how blunt a tool the current rating system is, what would you change that would have an, a fair impact on farmers? Because what we're proposing is this is step one of potentially other changes further down the track of our long-term plan. So I'd be really keen to understand, would there be some other levers we could specifically look at that might make it more palatable for the wider farming rural community. Okay, so there used to be so that farmers paid 25% of the general rate. Before that it was 31%. Before that it was something else. And it has been changed over time once we discovered that there were fewer farmers than council thought there were because council thought that farm, every block of land had a farmer on it, which it doesn't. Um, so I think somehow the farming sector has to be ring-fenced and a percentage needs to be decided upon. That is fair. And that also is compatible if, if we look at incomes. I mean, farming incomes are a lot lower, I think, get you cash in the hand that people have got to spend on things than most people realise. And we're really fortunate that we don't have a big mortgage, but there's an awful lot of big mortgages out there, and I, I think there's farmers probably taking a lot less in the hand than we're actually getting in the hand. So it's just because you've got a farm doesn't mean that you're rich. So that needs to happen. Um, another thing that could possibly be introduced is maybe a stepped differential type thing, so that when you get to a certain um, value of capital value, that your rates don't go any higher. And I'm just thinking of... Um, People who like chicken farmers and pig farmers who have got high capital values but who probably employ quite a lot of people and are necessary for the district. What's going to happen if, if we go to capital value for something like Turks um, out, and, out, out in the country? I don't know. So maybe there's, there, are, there are other things you need to look at so that you just don't pay more and more and more as your capital value goes up. So it's, it's fair for everyone. 
Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate your time and effort that you've put into that submission, and your points will be uh, considered along with everyone else's. Cheers. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, um, our next submitter is Phil Richards, and Phil's submission is page 885 or page 64 of your hearing book. Welcome, uh, Phil. Um, so take a seat in front, and the button on the right-hand side of that microphone is the one that you turn on, It'll put on a red light, and that means that you're all set to go. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Warren, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Thank you for hearing me. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a small plot holder from OHA, um, and uh, we're building a new build in the area. And during that new build, I've come across a number of things that I think could be addressed better by this council, by this world, by our government indeed. And that is that I'm trying to build a net zero home um, where we don't become dependent upon the council for any of the services. We harvest our own water, we produce our own power, and we get rid of our own sewage um, with biotanks so that we produce little in the way of waste. We are very mindful of the waste that we take to council that will go to landfill. There's a lot of that that we cannot change. And I find, I, I find that very hurtful, to be quite honest. I hate the idea of my rubbish going to be deposited for perpetuity in somebody else's landfill, which is why I object to Levin's landfill going to Martin. We need to be responsible for handling our own. And um, we have a looming problem with regard to Taraika, the building that will take place there, building waste, and indeed the uh, expansion of the waste that will produce from the additional houses. If you expect a different outcome from doing the same thing, that's the that's the, the definition of lunacy. So we need to actually look at a results-driven approach to what we're doing, not um, a modification of what we're currently doing. And if I had something that I can offer towards that, I would really like to do that. Now, my wife was away for six months recently, and I took one 60-litre bag of rubbish to waste landfill in six months. Um, and that was purely... Um, stuff that I could not dispose of by composting, eating, or by other means. So it can be reduced, and it takes a philosophy. Um, we, I don't know what the council's philosophy is with regard to um, rules for supermarkets and places like that, where we could cut down probably 50% of the waste. I stopped buying meat in that time, and lived as a vegetarian, and I basically ate all my waste. Um, and the rest I composted. So if we could stop the packaging on just meat alone. So that's a philosophy. The other thing I, I would like to um, ask for is that the council actually encourage or do more to encourage eco-building. I don't know whether you realise it or not. It's actually really hard to build an eco-home. For a start, you can't get a builder. They don't do that. No, we don't do that. We don't do it that way. Well, hang on, there's a better way to do it. Yeah, but we don't do that. Then for everything that you buy, it costs more because it's not normal and you pay additional GST on that and so it goes on. It's a really, really difficult thing. It's cost us everything to have a house which is not going to be a permanent um, problem for councils or need to be a beneficiary of something like water reticulation and the problems that that brings, sewage reticulation. So if there's a way we could encourage people in Taraika to build with a different frame of mind, that's a place where we could start. And I have to say that the building, the people who administer the building, new buildings in the council, are the best 
council I've ever dealt with, and I've dealt with four with new builds. They are head and shoulders above everybody else that I've dealt with. Um, so I would like to congratulate them on that. But there's more we can do. If through my build and my experience there's anything I can offer, you get that for nothing. And we've done concreteness footings. We've built our own beams which don't require huge amounts of wood. We have wasted enormous amounts of jib because there is no way that we can get around it. But everything, all of that jib was 100% recyclable and can be turned back into other jib. So I would strongly urge the council to look at um, a jib, a method of jib disposal and handling building waste that we can handle and recycle, that we do that as part of the vision of building Tara Eka. Um, what more I can offer, I'm not too sure. I just wanted to raise these things and say that um, I, I think that if people are building their own sewerage system, which is a bio-neutral um, sewerage system, then they shouldn't be subjected to any fees for reticulated sewerage. That if they're producing their own water, they shouldn't be subjected to fees for water reticulation. Now, I do believe understand that there is a, um, a common cost to being part of a society, and I accept that. I do think that there is a way where, with a development fund, where there was a deposit, perhaps, for um, against the waste that they would produce, that if they involve themselves in certain initiatives to prevent that waste, and can be shown that they didn't subject landfills and stuff like that to the waste of the, and they recycled more, that in the end they would get part of that development fund back uh, for doing the right things. It's a way of encouraging it. Other than that, I don't know what more I could offer except that um, if there was something that I can do as a citizen in Horofana to encourage people to go down this route, um, to try and show them different ways to build because the current ways are chronically wasteful. I, I don't, don't know whether you realise it, but when you jib a house, and I did my own, and I was very, very careful with the survey of the jib, um, and in the end I acquiesced to a builder who was assisting, and they overestimate massively. Um, there's uh, people who do jib surveys, so we could perhaps use that as an incentive to say, if you use this jib survey, you would be credited this much in your consent fees because there wouldn't be that waste going to landfill. Initiatives like that might be well worth it, and it might cost them $300 to have the survey done, but it would probably save them $1,200 in jib because... Trying to be sensitive to that, I still took 800 kilos of jib waste to the tip. And now that was fully recycled. So it's just these things that, that, that really grind me because I think that we need new initiatives to that. So if I could offer anything to help with that, I would be very keen to do that. Um, thank you for the time. And... Um, what are we going to do about the waste? Are we going to Martin? Do we have other initiatives? So um, that is one of the considerations for this long-term plan amendment is the decision on the future of the landfill and how we, how we deal with our waste. The first decision is dealing with the future closure of the landfill or not. Then the whole waste minimisation strategy policy will need to be looked at. Uh, but we've got to get a decision around what happens to the landfill first uh, before we then start that process. And what you've raised today is some pretty um, sort of valid points in terms of you know ways that we could look at different uh, things that we could do. Um, but I'll just open it up to any questions first. Councillor Brennan. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Thanks for your very, very um, insightful. Um, submission it was very interesting. So thank you. My question's around um, alternate disposal methods for our waste, and uh, just asking if you're obviously or you may be aware of the bio plant application in the Mautu district in terms of pyrolysis. Sorry, say, 
so sorry, the the, the um, pyrolysis application by an outfit called Bioplant up in um, the Mineral Two District, where they uh, the pyrolysis where they burn the waste. Are you aware of that? At all? No, I'm not aware. No, of that. Okay, it's an application that's going through at the moment, but um, so it's an alternative um, usage of uh, energy to. Um, Burn waste, but then you can get some outputs from it too. Like diesel creates uh, energy power, and I think carbon carbonates or something like that. So, uh, you, haven't, you haven't heard of pyrolysis? No. Um, okay. To be quite honest, I spend from about seven thirty in the morning until I can't see at night building, um, okay. because we had a build go bad, and um, uh, the guy has gone insolvent, and we're a hundred thousand dollars out. And okay. I had to absolutely undo every stick of building that he did and rebuild it, which is one of the reasons why I'm so complimentary on the guys from the building team, um, because they have been very helpful. We had to scrub every stick of wood, treat it, so that we're allowed to reuse it. So they've given us a lot of leeway at concession. Um, I try, I've read the rules. I've read NZ3604. I read brands. Um, to find out the best method. And indeed, we involved the council long before the build even took place, before I built bought the section, because I felt that it was a coordinated approach to achieving what we needed to achieve. I'm not a process-driven person. I'm a results-driven person. And I don't care what means we use, as long as they're the best means. And um, so... I agree entirely with alternate means. I would like to know more about that. My question is, if you're burning it, what happens to the byproducts of exhaust? And that's the hold up with the application, as yeah. I understand it. But yeah, it's just interesting enough if you knew about that. And yeah, have a look at it. It's quite interesting. Thank you. Because I don't even burn on the section, because I what I'm burning on the section goes into the atmosphere, and that's troubling me. Um, so, so yeah. yeah, have a look at that. The bio plant is called. Cool. We'll have a look at bio plant. Yeah. Uh, is there anything on the horizon with regard to things like jib salvage? Because I contacted the the council prior to my disposal of that. Um, a lot of that I'm trying to dig in because it's gypsum. It holds moisture. It's good for the garden. But not all of the product. Like if you're using the um, boards which are structurally uh, used for stressed members in them, they have a, a component of glass fibre in them. Uh, which which is not particularly good for for the soil or um, putting into the ground. So, um, look, Phil, no, I, I can't answer that initially. But, look, you've raised some pretty interesting uh, points in terms of the whole sort of waste, um, if you like, minimisation um, structural policy that we need to uh, look at. I can see you being uh, extremely valuable uh, when we do talk about our waste minimisation strategy. And I'm sure officers are taking note of your experiences and your knowledge and also uh, what you're trying to, uh, to achieve in terms of that. And I can see you playing a big part in being consulted on uh, our future waste minimisation policy. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can do that. Can I also thank you and acknowledge the comments you've made about the staff? Um, it's great to hear that feedback. Uh, as, as governors, we often are removed from that, but having that sort of feedback from you is, uh, you know, I really thank you for that. Um, and look, we've got some pretty big considerations in front of us, not only with this amendment to the long-term plan, but the future waste minimisation strategy. There's so much happening in that space um, that we need to, you know, balance up with the realities of um, economics and what we can do. So, you know, I really appreciate the time and effort that you've gone. Um, I see Councillor Tupu wants to ask a question. No, no really time for questions. Just to say that um, I agree. I, I hope you come back and have more input. In I'm that. not going anywhere, love. I'm 75 years of age and <laughs> this is, uh, I, I'm doing things now that I say, well, I'll never do that again in my life. Um, and um, But I, I, I think that um, like with all democracies, if you are not passionately involved, there is no democracy. And uh, a society is 
an extraordinarily valuable place to live. And, and I think that this is a great society. Um, we didn't have to come here. We chose to come here. And um, I'm just sorry that the motor racing track is not still here because <laughs> as a, a teenager in 1968, I won my first, one of my first national titles right over there. Oh, awesome. So it's been a love of Levin for a very long time. Thank you. And we would um, totally um, agree with your comments about how you know, great this area is to be a part of. And, and look, while we may not be perfect, we're certainly trying really hard to uh, make this continue to be a great place to, to live and, um, and contribute to. So thank you very much for the part that you play in that. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Councillors, that brings us to the end of our first uh, session. Um, we will resume at 4.15. Thank you very much.
coalition of community and environmental groups in the Horathanura and Kapiti campaigning to close the Levin landfill. Uh, we have a Facebook page of about 230 odd uh, followers, a website which disseminates information at www.overitll.org. And the campaign was created in a way to amplify um, the community's, um, I guess, voice. So the Live in Landfill Agreement was honoured by the District Council. Uh, the supporters of the campaign have had enough of of, of the ongoing uncertainty around the future of the landfill and the detrimental environmental, um, social, economic and uh, impacts of the poor management and operation of the landfill. Uh, an earlier uh, community-run petition raised some 1,600 signatures supporting closure from t uh, that was earlier about 2017 and over it um, it contained another 300 signatures um, in the early 2020s. Uh, over many decades, the voices of concern and outrage have been ignored by the council over this landfill. This has built a very high level of distrust with the authorities, both with the district council and the regional council who have overseen this um, the resource consents that the landfill is being run under. Um, we've, we distrust the motives and um, whether the council will do the right thing by the community and the environment. The Levin Landfill Agreement was a positive step uh, in the right direction. The fact that the District Council got the, pro the process totally wrong last year was, was very, very disappointing. And we're now having to go through the second set of submissions uh, just underlines how poorly the council have done in the past. On a positive note, um, we believe that the changes we've seen in the district council with the new chief executive in particular and the many new faces that we see around the council table this term gives us hope that we're close to seeing this white elephant permanently closed. The environment needs to be remediated, of course, and of course the trust needs to be restored between the community and the district council. Um, over it supports the permanent closure of the Vin landfill, and we hope that the council will see, see their way through to achieve that outcome for the community and the environment's good. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I might take the opportunity of asking the first question around, I see the preferred option for the group is option two, and that is um, continue sending our waste elsewhere and use the site for something else. We've had a, also a number of submissions um, saying um, continue sending waste elsewhere, don't use the site for anything else as well. And I just wondered if you had any comments um, why over it chose option two. Well, I think we can't we can't be closed to um, future purpose for that site. Of course, we, we don't want to see anything that's likely to have negative impacts, either socially, uh, I guess, culturally or environmentally. Like, for example, the potential for, um, um, uh, I think there was talk of um, a um, uh, green waste um, composting initiative there. You know, that would be totally, um, um, I guess, uh, out of our, our mindset, we would not support that. But we, we envisage that any future use, the council would come to the community, we would have an open and honest discussion, and the council would take into account the community's wishes. We want to make sure that we don't close off any opportunity. Um, we'd like to see that site uh, fully remediated, um, and if potential... Um, is there for community use or for for a, a use that fits the site, being in in, in sand um, with rubbish on it already? Uh, you know, so we're just very cognizant that it, any use has to be very carefully managed and carefully uh, carefully agreed with the community. Thank you. Any further questions of Peter?
There don't appear to be any uh, further questions, um, Peter, but we note that you've also been given the opportunity to speak on your own behalf. Uh, is, is it a different um, submission or a repeat of the first? Um, no, it's, a, it's, it's slightly different. It's from a personal note. Um, and, um, again, it, it is, while... Um, um, I've submitted on all the, you know, for, the, for over it, I only, we only submitted on the landfill, particularly the option, <laughs> the landfill option. I've submitted on all the other uh, amendments proposed and my, you know, so my views are known there, but um, I do want to focus on the landfill, if that's okay. Sure. And hopefully you're not getting sick of my voice. No, no, go for it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, in my submission, I attached my original original submission from the first first go we had at this process. I supported the option at the time to close the live-in landfill in, in 2022. Uh, the irony is not lost on me that we're now sitting in May 2023, which is most unfortunate. Uh, all the reasons I laid out in the original submission still hold true. You know, there's nothing's really changed. The only change that we've had is that the temper the landfill has been temporarily closed. And that over that period of the last few years, the smells have reduced. Um, the landfill, obviously with the landfill now properly capped and not operating on a day-by-day -day basis, i.e. no operational um, uncapped rubbish is floating around, the smell's not disseminating from the boundary, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. My whanau... I've had a property at Hokio Beach for the past 15 plus years. Uh, we, we're a resident in Wellington, but in 2015 we resided in Hokio for a period of time and we became acutely aware of the impacts of the landfill on the operation. My submission highlights the numerous reasons that I support option two to keep the landfill closed permanently, but also to re obviously remediate the environment and see if any future use fits that site. And I, I stress fits that site. You know, there's a, there's a necessity, necessity here to engage with the community to make sure that the community has an, a, a well listened to and active voice in any decision making. And But I do want to stress right now and highlight in the event the council don't choose to keep this landfill closed, they are, are not only exposing themselves, but they're exposing the rate for, rate payers of Porafanua to further legal action in the Environment Court, and secondly, to the ongoing financial risk of running a landfill. You know, this we're talking about one that's poorly sited, and in 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 again in Sand Hill, Sand Country, one with an inefficient gas capture, one that has a history of non-compliance, one that has had numerous reviews and the, and the heavy cost of those reviews and the obviously the other thing is as we know there's an inevitable ongoing increased cost to running such a venture it hasn't proven to be an economic success in the past so i don't see how that how that is all of a sudden going to change more debt will acquire more damage to the environment and more damage particularly to the relationships with the community I feel very positive um, about the engagement that the, the district council has had with the community in recent months. And again, from the over its submission and my presentation not slightly earlier, you know, I feel feel like we're on a, a good path here. I look forward to that continuing. And after the permanent closure of the landfill is confirmed, I hope that um, further engagement with the community and build, building these relationships. In a, in a proactive and a healthy way continues to, to eventuate. Thank you. Um, thank you again, Peter, um, and well articulated um, and appreciate the fact that you have taken, um, you know, this role in terms of even though you're only, a, I suppose, a, if you like, an intermittent uh, resident of the Horofanoa, that you still have taken an active role in terms of what you're doing. And if I could go back to... Um, issue one, which is the rates review, and your option there has been to say that we should move to a capital value rating base. Just wondered if you could 
give some um, sort of thinking around why you supported that and maybe your experience in Wellington as a ratepayer has, has that influenced that in any way? Um, oh, well, I think, I mean, underlying my motives and, my, and um, I, I have a strong sense of social justice and, and fairness and, and equitably, equitable charging. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think that by doing this, it becomes more affordable for many more people that actually can't afford any increase. And we notice, you know, we know that we're all going to be facing a huge amount of rates increase in the future. And, and understandably so with rising costs and the lack of investment and, um, I guess care that's been taken across, um, things like maintenance of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's right. While it's inevitable, I see that change to the rating structure as providing a more um, equitable outcome for the community for rate pays. Thank you. Just checking if anyone else has got any questions for you. Councillor Grimster. Uh, Peter, not quite off topic, but thinking about the landfill and the closure and alternative use, maybe not necessarily of the site, but... Uh, already today, and in a, a later submission from Terry Hemmingson, uh, he, he suggests consideration for council to essentially look at options for incineration of waste as a good way of managing waste moving forward. Now, given your background and expertise, I was just keen to, I guess, probe your thoughts on, on that option. Oh, it's an, an, an interesting you, you raise that. It's a, a very good question. And um, I actually was out on a, a walk last night talking to an engineer about this very issue. Um, because the, if we, I think if we, um, his gripe, he say, uh, he, he, he strongly believes in pyrolysis as a, um, key enabler to circular economy. And I, t I, to most extent, agree with him. Now, I know that the, the latest waste minimisation pa um, planning and paper from the government effectively bans incineration of waste or will ban incineration of waste. I don't know the exact detail. Um, but the reality is from overseas experience, um, paralysis is and can be and is um, actively uh, used in, in, that, in that last stage of waste to, if you like waste to value where the, where the material has no other use and no other pathway um and it can be done with very minimal uh i guess um um flow flow on effects and waste in the environment etc it is quite a clean technology if it's done well and ha having said it needs to be done well whether it um is um affordable at the scale um, for the horror I would doubt. Um, I have experience of an initiative from America through the Edmund Hillary Fellowship where they were looking and they are, I know they are still are looking at Upper Hutt as a potential site for um, a pyrolysis plant, plant waste to energy. Um, and at that state, at that size, that's probably a reasonable um, economic, if you like, um, commercial uh, possibility, but I'm not sure whether that uh, would apply to uh, smaller volumes like um, are likely to be available at the Horofenua site. Thank you, um, Peter. Really appreciate your time and um, and the way you've articulated your views. And um, I'm sure. Um, you will follow the discussion and debate that we have over the next few weeks with interest. So, sure. thank, yeah, thank you, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. And also, um, I um, implore uh, the councillors to make the right decision. Cheers. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, councillors, we're now moving back to um, the first uh, submitter following our break, which is Gear Thompson, page 1779 or page 69 in your hearing book. 
Um, Gear, I see you there. Can you hear us okay? We can't hear you. Sorry. Can you hear us, dear? He won't see. He won't see. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, that sounds better. That sounds much better. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, welcome, uh, Gear. We have your um, submission in front of us, and you've got 10 minutes, so off you go. Yep. Thanks very much. Um, no, thanks very much for uh, the opportunity and um, the chance to speak. Uh, I'll just whip through a few things and then I've got another point or two I'd like to mention. Um, I prefer to leave the rating on the land value system um, and I would like to uh, counsel to try and save some money by adopting those suggestions that they had for reducing maintenance and saving money. On the landfill, I can't see the wisdom in um, taking the, uh, all the rubbish to Rangitiki it doesn't seem very environmentally friendly, and um, I can't understand why it can't be operated from the site you already have uh, designated for a landfill, and why you can't perhaps use some of those other activities there as well, which would generate some income and uh, save people having to go a long way to, to get rid of rubbish or having the rubbish taken a long way. It uh, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, and even if you have to take rubbish from one of the other areas and get some money for that, um, well, you have the consent anyway. Um, water meters, I feel um, some of the time um, water meters, a lot of money is spent on purchasing them, installing them, and reading them, and all the bureaucracy that goes with it. Um, I believe that probably some of the money would be better spent making sure pipes weren't leaking and uh, keep as many of them as possible in good condition. Um, I think also with the development levies, a lot of the new developments should uh, be paying their share of getting the cost of the water to their subdivisions rather than putting that burden on the rest of the ratepayers. Um, with Foxton, I think... Uh, Fair enough. Um, spend the money in Foxton. It's come from the Foxton area, so spend it there. And um, on the general point, though, um, I think like a lot of local bodies, sometimes they tend to get bloated. I don't know about Horofanua, but I know some other ones. They get a bloated administration, and um, I think a lot of their costs could be kept down a lot more if they were a bit... Um, uh, careful on, on their cost structures. But um, on a further point, um, I'm just trying to work out why the Levin water supply pressure has been reduced in the last few years and now doesn't um, comply with those that, like us at the mall there that have a sprinkler system, um, which we've been told now the pressure is not sufficient. Um, you know, compared with other places, the pressure is quite a lot higher. I assume it is being done to prevent leaks in the water pipes, but um, I'd certainly like to know because I feel it's not really we um, removed the old tanks because the water supply was sufficient and was said to be so. That was a few years ago, and we left them there for a number of years and it still didn't become an issue. So we got rid of them, and um, but now apparently it is a an issue, and I'd like somebody to try and work out what what's going on in that direction. But um, I think Horafanua or Levin, anyway, has certainly got a good future with um, the improved access via the motorways to um, Levin, and um, I wish you all the well for um, making the most of that. Thank you, Gear. Um, any questions? Deputy Mayor. Could I just, Gare, thank you for your submission. Um, I just want to check that I heard you right. 
Did you say you supported the general rate based on land value or capital value? I thought I heard you say land value. Yeah. That's so, right. So, so in your submission, and it may have been a misprint you identified. Oh, well, I thought I, that's what I put in my submission, didn't I? Uh, maybe. What did I have on the submission? Because I, I, when I, yeah, I think you said capital value, but no, that's, oh, that's yeah, that's noted. Did you want to give a reason why while we have you here? Oh well, maybe I must have to have another look at that. But I followed through on uh, just on the what I've. That printed out when I filled it in, and it said that. So I thought, well, that must have been what I worked out at the time. But um, maybe I better have another look at that. No, it's, it's not. Different. Yeah, it's no problem. You've clarified it now. But I'd just be interested in understanding why you support land value as the option. Well, I I must admit I just went through my printed form that was on the email and went through and because I looked at it some time ago and then went through and thought, well, I must have looked at the situation. And that told me, I think, that I supported land value. So I don't know. But I know in a lot of areas, capital value um, works quite well um, because um, – but uh, I'll, I'll need to check that and get back to you. No problem. And thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Sorry about that. Kassa no Tukapur. My question would be um, to officers, actually, in regards to the concern made around water pressure. If we could get a follow-up um, on that, that would be great. Yeah. So did you hear that, um, Gia? We're yes, just no, noting no. Your, your concerns around the water pressure, and we will um, make sure that we receive some information regarding that. That would be great, because it Fix our building water fitness and uh, yep, yeah, for sure. no, yes, uh, yeah, just like a response because you mentioned that you would like council to focus a little bit more on the pipes, um, and, and fixing those, but that runs contrary to your indication that you prefer option four, which, which means no water metering, but also dictates that we reduce work on current budget. Now, if we took that option, that, um, and I'm reading from, from the paper, there's no additional investment in our water infrastructure. We slow investment in new water infrastructure, and we defer renewals and replacement of old pipes where possible. So, yeah, I agree with that, but if you're going to be spending money, um, I think it would be better spent doing some of those things if you ha if you do decide you would need to spend it for some reason rather than on water meters and um, installing them and fixing them and replacing them and sending bills out on them and that sort of thing. Um, I just think that uh, a lot of time and money can get spent on them that uh, would be better not. Um, I, I do also have another concern with the drainage system, though. Um, we've got a major drain that goes through Levin Moor, which um, is not, um, I understand, in particularly good condition. And um, we're trying to get a, a copy of a, um, a photo of it um, and seeing what it is like. But I, I have heard that the pipes don't even line up and there's seepage and stuff going on underground. So that's the sort of thing that really needs sorting if it is like we suspect it is, because you get subsidence and all sorts of things going on when the ground's getting saturated like that all the time. And uh, we, a number of years ago, we managed to get the council to stop discharging overflow water just out the back there, which didn't go anywhere, it just went out the back. And you could tell the ground was sinking because the, the building was at one level and down below you could see where the ground, where it had been, the paint or where the paint was painted to, and then the ground had sunk. And I think some of those stormwater systems, because we've had experience with them when they they have a heavy rain, they they don't get rid of the water enough and it backs up and that doesn't let it get away off our roofs and other people's roofs 
quickly enough. And uh, I know even the the drain out the front by the library there, a lot of the time when I've been there, is full of leaves too. So it makes me wonder how regularly some of those things are actually checked. Councillor Boyle, did you have a... Councillor Boyle. Uh, just quickly, because we're already over time, uh, I know you've put in your submission on behalf of an organisation which I can't find anything about online. I was wondering if you could comment on the nature of that organisation and also comment on if you're an ordinary resident of Levin. No, I'm not a resident of Levin. I normally live in Nelson and I had a bit of trouble getting on the Zoom thing because the iPad tried to tell me that I wasn't where I should be. Um, but anyway, no. so what was the first part of the question? Uh, so you've put in your submission on behalf of an organisation, TBG Limited. I'm yeah, just yes. wondering the nature of that organisation. Well, it stands for Thompson Property Group, and um, we've got properties we go from Wanganui to Invercargill, where I am at the moment. And um, so it's under different companies. The one in Levin is under Armour Investments Limited. But, All right. um, cool. Yeah, no, that, yeah. That, that answers my questions adequately. Thank you. No trouble. Um, yeah, and just to reassure you that um, the stormwater issues around uh, the central business district of the town are being looked at, and the, Good. Um, solving the issue around um, the mall and the car park and across uh, further um, to the west, um, that solution is on the work program at the moment. Okay. Thank you for that. All right, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for making your submission and um, uh, being with us today. Good. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next submitted councillor is, is uh, Terry Grummet, which is page 1407 of your submission folders or page 91 of your hearing schedule uh, booklet. Um, Terry, I see you there. Welcome. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, right. Just take a while to connect. Can you see me, Terry? Well, you're so far away, she probably can. So we're just going to ring um, Terry and try and solve those technical issues. While doing that, we'll now move to um, Bernadette, which is 1,332 of your folders or 98 of your booklet. Welcome, Bernadette. Can you hear me okay? 
I can. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. That's great. Good to see technology is working okay. Um, so we have 10 minutes, so welcome and um, thank you for your uh, participation today. And I'll let you take the floor. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, Benedict Casey Tokawingawa. I'm one of the co-founders of Usefully, and we work in that waste to value space developing science-based solutions. We have led the textile and clothing industry co-design of a national scale textile circular economy, and our consulting arm advises central and local governments on circular economy. I live in Wellington with my husband, Peter, who spoke earlier, and we have a batch at Hokioya Beach, and we love to escape the city up there to the untamed and open coast. I'm going to be speaking today just on the landfill only. Um, I'll keep it brief. As you're all aware, the living landfill has been problematic ever since it was established in two, uh, ever since it was established in 2015, I made my first submission on the landfill, so that's seven years ago. And others have been raising the, their concerns literally for decades. But years later, we are still discussing the harm this landfill is continuing to cause fiscally, environmentally, and to the people of Levin. Last year, I made a further submission and over the years, I've heard so many concerning justifications come from previous councils, like a councillor com commenting that dumping our waste in Bonnie Glen is unfair on the Rangitiki community, which does call into question how they value their own community. And just last year, a councillor saying, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, it is going to cost local businesses more if they don't have the convenience of a dump on their doorstep, which is a really poor argument and ignores the business's externalised costs of pollution and emissions, which is carried by the rest of the community. Um, I do understand that the, the tension that exists within H HTC, on one hand being required to meet national expectations of waste and emissions reduction, while on the other hand, until recently, earning revenue from waste disposal at the landfill. But the economics don't head up and they haven't for a long time if they ever really did. However, I am optimistic that under the new leadership and with new councillors at HDC that the right and responsible decision can finally be reached. Rather than a dirty old toxic landfill, the community has a much better and more hopeful and ambitious vision for Hora Whenua. And we hope that you, the people elected to represent us around the table, want a better future too. And if you do, then there's really only one decision to make, and that is to permanently close the landfill. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, um, Bernadette. Um, i just ask councillors, do they have any questions at all? Councillor Boyle. Uh, one quick, Barry, love your submission. I note that you've made comments for alternative site use about rewilding the site. I wondered if you wanted to talk slightly more to that, given that alternate site use is something Council's considering through this process. Yeah, um, as you know, in our, in our daytime job is really um, working in that waste to value um, space and looking at the economics of it and um, looking at where the location of that site is and in landfill. Um, rewilding is a really viable option and and it really comes from looking at it internationally. What's happening, and I know particularly in Europe where smaller towns and smaller regions like the Hot of Whenua, they actually compete to create the, the best environment that they can to attract and to draw um, rate-paying citizens into their regions. And so instead of having, you know, um, it necessarily industry, but having these wild spaces that people can enjoy is a real attraction for ratepayers. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, look, really appreciate your time and the fact that you submitted and are uh, um, participating in this hearings uh, process. 
Um, we will no doubt uh, be watching, or well, you will no doubt be watching with interest over the next uh, few weeks as we come to deliberate and make some decisions around uh, these issues. But yeah, just acknowledge uh, the fact that you've taken the time to submit. We do appreciate it. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, Councillors, we're going back to try again um, with Terry. Hello. Oh, success. Thank you, uh, Terry. Welcome. And um, uh, appreciate your patience and, um, and your tenacity to make sure that you're able to, um, um, you know, enjoy this process. Um, we have read your submission and we have 10 minutes in front of us. So um, if you want to make any comments before questions, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I just really wanted to, to reiterate that I'm um, opposed to the proposed change to, to change the rating basis from land value to capital value. Um, I believe that it won't achieve equity. I'm not even sure that the, um, the goal of equity is, is an achievable goal or a good goal to have. Um, I'm really concerned that property value um, has come about in various ways. Some a person isn't in has no control over the value that um, rateable or quotable value might put on their property. It could be a property that they've owned for a very long time, and the rates uh, the property value may have crept up over time. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, reflect their ability to pay rates. It certainly doesn't relate to the cash flow that they have. Uh, high property values might even signal that that the owner has very high mortgage commitments. Um, it, a, a rise in um, rates that looks like it could be around 30% is just outrageous. It's just not really something that... Uh, rate payers can cope with in a single change like that. It's it's just not just, not fair. Um, in fact, I think it could actually cause people to have to look at selling their homes um, because the rates will be unaffordable. So I, I think that that it does not achieve any sense of equity and that is the reason why I'm opposed to this change. Thank you. Um, councillors, any questions? Deputy Mayor Al. Look, thank you very much for your submission and I appreciate the, the very real uh, message you're bringing us about the, Im the impact financially on the change. Um, there may be ways that those things can be managed through different mechanisms, but that aside, could I understand from you in principle whether you feel that capital value versus land value, which to you seems to be a fairer, more reasonable way to fix the general rate? Land value. And could I understand why? In principle, not, not because of the financial impact, which I do get and which is real, but in principle, why is land value a fairer system than capital value? Um, I, I don't really like the concept of fairness, in all, uh, to be honest. So um, I, do, I do feel that land value is, is unlikely to be as have extreme distant differences as the extreme differences that you might see in capital values. Um, so within a street, I would expect properties of similar um, size will have similar land value, whereas they may not have similar capital value. So it feels to me like land value gives a better measure 
given that properties all receive the same services, gives a better measure of what um, what should be charged for that property. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. You live in a wonderful part of the world, though, Terry. You would say, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yes. Cool. Really, just wanted that assurance that you do. Um, you know, we know how nice it is in that part of the world um, we live in. Um, look, just want to thank you for the time that you've taken to submit to us, and I can assure you that the points you raise have been raised by a number of submitters and will form certainly part of the consideration and discussion and debate that we will have over the next few weeks as we move into deliberations and decision-making time. Um, but, yeah, really appreciate your time, um, and thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Our next submitter is uh, Christopher Drinkwater, and Christopher is here in person instead of being on Zoom. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for taking the time to be here in person. Um, please join us at the table. Uh, Chris's uh, submission is on page 1860 or page 107 in your uh, hearing book. Um, Chris, the right hand button is the one that you turn on and it will uh, put on a red light and that means that you, uh, we will hear you. Um, so welcome and the floor is yours. Kia ora, thank you and welcome Bernie. Oh, sorry, welcome. My name is Christopher Drinkwater, I'm a resident and um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm a bit overwhelmed with the number of people here, first time I've ever put any submission in my life in. I need to ask all of you, and I want you to answer this yourselves and be honest with yourselves. Do you, and do you, and do you, earn more than $30 an hour? I'm a pensioner at 67 years of age. And guess what? My hourly rate is less than $10 an hour. Every time you, council, produce a plan, to increase rates, etc., you start this process of stifling my life. You start the process of putting me in that coffin, which sounds a bit heavy handed, but you know what? It's not. Because every time you put my rates up, I suffer and I suffer heavily. Do you think it's okay to <coughs> increase my rates annually? It's actually not. This country as a whole, and the council should take note of this, should look at the way you gather your rates and the way you tax your rate payers, because it's not fair. Your parents wouldn't think it's fair, and if, if you think you could survive on $10 an hour, or less than $10 an hour, well, I'd love to see you try as pensioners struggle even to put food on the table, the reality is you as a panel fail me and you fail all pensioners and you don't give us a fair deal. We are pension poor. We do not get real percentage increases each year. That's a myth. And when you, and I'm going to say this, overpaid people propose an overall increase in our rates, you steal from our pensioner quality of life. Stop it. Shame on you. And shame on your parents for making you such capitalist people. Yes, I live at Waitareri Beach, but I've got a mortgage that I have to pay for the next 11 years. At 67, I suspect I'll be dead when my mortgage is paid off in 11 years' time. <clears throat> I do not support any council in rates increase above the cost of the CPI annually. You make me pension poor 
because of your rates increases. You are killing me with just unjustified rates increases. Shame on you all. If you support the latest proposals, you really should take a good hard look at yourselves and perhaps not stand next time there's an election. Finally, I'm going to offer you a gift. This gift I have in this bag, if I can go and put on the table. It's a can of baked beans, and guess where these come from? This is where i forced to go to the food bank. So what I'm giving you is a can of baked beans, which has come from the food bank. That's my meal sometimes during the week. Stop killing me. Stop putting rates up. And that's about all I really have to say. Thank you for the time of listening to me. I will answer questions, but I'm a wee bit fragile, as you can probably tell from putting this submission in. Thank Look, you. Thank, thank you, Chris. Well, look, I appreciate the fact that I can see that it's obviously, um, you know, difficult, and, and this is an intimidating um, room to be presenting in, and I, I, we're trying to make it as uh, amenable as possible, if you like, but the fact that you've turned up today, obviously, um, you know, this means something pretty significant to you, and, and we appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to do that. Um, look, none of us like doing what we're doing in terms of putting costs up, but have you got a solution in terms of what we do um, and, and this is not just a local council thing. This is a this is a country um, issue. Um, what do we do? I've got a lot of solutions. Why do you invest a bit more in pensioner housing? Why do you give pensioners a safe place to live? Because there are people like me who struggle. And it will get to the stage if in three or four or five years' time, if I have to sell my house, guess where I'm going to be knocking on to, to look for someone to look after me, council doors or somewhere like that. There are a lot of other suggestions as well, but it's not really the right forum. But basically, the whole of New Zealand ne needs to move away from this thing of capital gains. Tax, tax, tax. It's wrong. The system's wrong, it is broken and it needs to be fixed. I don't know what the magic answer is, and I never will do, I don't think, because I'm not that well educated. But I'm just trying to tell you, it's a real struggle out there. Yes, I've got a car that's five years old, but I struggle if I have to put petrol in it. Councillor Brenning. First thing I'll say, Chris, is um, I do struggle with some of your emotive language, but I but I accept it and I understand it. But the Mayor asked you a pretty good question because you come in here and, and you, you said what you've said. And, and again, I accept it. I don't agree with it, all of it, but I accept it. Um, what should, in your view, Council stop doing to bring rates down? What should they stop doing? Because every... Because, because every long-term plan, annual plan, long-term plan amendment, we come in and people want stuff. The communities want stuff. Okay? So give us, give us an idea. Yep. A local example. I live at Wairarere Beach in a new subdivision. My house is four years old. There's no curb and channeling in the street. The council don't even mow the lawns in my street. You, you might think that's stupid. I go down and mow the berms in this full street. It's, it's quite phenomenal because you guys don't mow the lawns. I'm quite proud of where I live, but I shouldn't have to be mowing my lawns. And it's a council policy where you guys say, once a developer has developed somewhere, uh, for two years after title comes through, which happened to be the 12th of March last year, that uh, the developer will pay 
pay for the loans to be mined for a couple of years afterwards, two years afterwards. She hasn't got the money. <laughs> she does not have the money. I know that for a fact. What really peeves me off is I grumbled heavily about 12 months ago about flooding in my street, a brand new street that's sitting under half a metre of water because there's no curb and channeling. And now I see what I perceive to be an illegal pump station going in, which guess what, you're going to hate me in the next few months because that's my next thing I'm angry about now. You've spent all this money in ripping up Forest Road, draining the, the farming paddocks next door and pumping water out to the main road of Wairarui Beach. Where was that in your long-term plan? I guess the first question I'll be asking is, how, how, how much over a million dollars have you guys actually spent in the last two to three months in putting in a, a massive new pump station on the corner of Allen Lindsay and Forest Road? You wonder why people hate council? We don't hate council. We want to get on with council. But you actually don't work with your residents. I, I come in here today, I see big fat cat chairs. I don't know how many hours of the day you sit here, but I tell you what, I guess you must be pretty well paid to sit here all day thinking, oh, look at me, I'm the lord of the manor. I for you, that does not happen. Well, okay. Austin, um, I've got another question from Councillor Tommy Hana, and again, could I just ask you to push, no, push your button? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Christopher, um, I really appreciate your your submission today and the passion with which you bring it. Um, definitely hear you loud. Um, I suppose your can of baked beans resonates with me because um, while I'm quite lucky that maybe I don't have to use a food bank, I'm quite aware that many of my whānau do. Uh, I suppose I just wanted to really impress the question on you about you kept talking about the impact on you as a, as a pensioner, and, and I get that. What I really want to hear from you is how do you think that we can help pensioners across our district with this rating um, process that we're going through? Because maybe we haven't identified something in there that perhaps you that you have an idea where we can assist our pensioners because it's all of them. They're all struggling. Um, yeah, apologies. At my stage in life, I... <sighs> Sounds like I've had it pretty good. I worked in Wellington for 25 years. I moved to Paraparaumu. From Paraparaumu, I moved to Waikanae. But each time I was renting. Finally, I moved to live in an area that I could afford to buy a house in. There is a lack of pensioner housing in this town. There is a lack of... You can't even walk through the main street without getting overwhelmed with the smell of, of stock trucks was in your buy. Even up to six months ago, a pension tried to cross the road on Queen Street and Oxford Street. You do not make this a safe place to live. And how, you need to look after your elderly people a bit better. You seriously do. Thank you, um, Christopher. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate this. Um, said before the passion that you bring um, to the um, the process. Look, I acknowledge uh, the struggles that are out there today. Look, we, we understand and, and see that um, very vividly in our roles that we do. Um, can I, I hope that it's not the last time you come and um, talk to us um, and you are aware of the rates rebate scheme that is available to those. I don't qualify. You don't qualify. Okay, no, thank you. Yeah. And saying that, um, please take your can of baked beans home, um, or if you don't want to take it home, put, we'll put it into the um, food bank um, ourselves. Uh, but again, appreciate the time that you've taken to be here today and the way that you've delivered that um, presentation. Thank you very much. Kia ora, everybody. Councillors, our next um, submitter is uh, Jean Cohen, who will be on Zoom. Uh, she paid 640 
of your folders or 111 on your hearings booklet. Are you there, Jane? Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry. You can? Yes. Cool. Um, we can't see you, or can you see us okay? Is, is that okay? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. yeah. Kia ora and welcome. Um, Thank so you. So we've got your submission in front of us. Thank you for that. And uh, we've um, got 10 minutes, so the floor is yours. Okay. Well, I just needed to... Um, because reading through all the information that came through the post and also via email, that there was nothing in particular concerning Waikawa Beach uh, about the plans. Um, I think there was mention about Waikawa Stream with the with the water side of it, but you know the I think last year, the last two years, there was a lot of feedback feeding through the local councillors and also that posted on the Facebook and the community page about the Waikawa uh, access road off the um, state highway and also some of the issues that we've been having with access to the beach. But I didn't see anything in the key areas that were proposed or planned um, for, um, for the council uh, concerning Waikawa, which is why I sent through that submission or the feedback because I sent it through an email to the mayor as well. Um, Jen, I'm not sure whether you're aware of the consultation that is going on in the Waikawa Beach area at the moment about that specific item, which is the beach access. There are um, uh, a team of people running, uh, well, uh, putting together a report for council around that very thing at the moment, and I know that they are consulting with the local community. Are you not aware of that? Yes, I am aware of that. I'm um, I'm getting feedback uh, in minutes of the meetings that's been happening um, in regards to that. But as far as I'm um, aware, uh, with the last minutes that came through a couple of weeks ago, nothing has uh, made or no decision has been made so far. Uh, in regards to the public access. Um, that would be correct. There's a bit of a process to go through before um, a decision is made on that. Uh, but rest mm. assured, it is being considered and um, yeah. and, and deliberated on. Um, yeah. and so there's quite a bit of feedback, obviously, in terms of uh, from different uh, views and opinions on, on how that should happen. Okay. And, you know, I, I suppose the main thing that I put a, some, it was the rate increase that came through because there was some heated discussion on our community page in regards to how that's going to be calculated with the new rates in comparison to what us, Waikawa, um, property owners are getting because we, we do have our own sewage and we do have our own water and we're paying as much uh, rate as the living in the surrounding area. Uh, but uh, whether that will be fair for us having that um, proposed uh, rate calculation that was sent through to all the residents, I think that was one of the main areas that I wrote about. Um, you are correct. We've had a number of views um, around the, the rates issue, and as you can imagine, that is, uh, will be, um, they will all be considered again as we don't... Um, we consider those and have deliberations at the end of May, um, so the 30, 31st and 1st of June is the day that we'll be, uh, if you like, deciding on what the, um, the rates distribution um, challenge that we've got in front of us will, uh, will be. Um, I've got a question from the Deputy Mayor. Eugene, thank you for being part of this. Uh, do you want to share with us what the rates increase means for your household, what it means for you personally? It's, it isn't identified in your submission. Your choice. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the property in Waikawa is, is a holiday home for us, so it's mainly vacant um, during the year except for the holidays. So 
having a rate increase or identifying that the rates is going to be increasing, um, especially with the new calculation, it, it just seems unfair. Fear, especially with the services that we have ourselves. For example, we, you know, had spent money on um, the sewage in, in in the in the water tank and everything, and you know, having that rate increase, and also the fact that it's near the beach for me. It's is obviously properties near that the the the, um, the beach is the valley we tend to go up every year. So um, the property was bought as a retirement for my husband and I when the kids are out to university and move out of the house. Then we planning in the next five years to move there permanently. And you know, if if the rates increase is going to be going up, and I, we might not be able to afford to to keep the property if that's the case. Um, so just to give you you know uh, feedback on that and my concern is is the cost increase of that on us when we retired whether we'll we'll be able to afford to keep a property on retirement age um if the rates keeps going up every year based on the new calculation and based on the value of the houses as you know the properties in my cars have gone up i mean our family have been up there 40 plus years or my husband's family we've been up there 25 years and we've seen a, a very steep or, uh, you know, great increase over the last 20 plus years of the house values. And if that's going to happen in the next 10 years when we have retired, yeah, I don't think we'll be able to afford to keep the property and retire as we plan, which is one of the reasons, the main reason why we put the property there. So... If that answer your question, that that was my concern. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jean. Look, really appreciate the feedback. And um, as I said, um, all um, submissions will be considered and deliberated on uh, later this month, and and um, we will, you know, make a good job hopefully of uh, listening and hearing what uh, people like yourself have said and um, you'll no doubt also hear the result of those uh, deliberations at some stage but note that your uh, feedback is valued and we appreciate you being spending time with us today as well thank you and thank you so much all right thank all right. you bye bye just a few minutes early Cases, we are running a few minutes ahead of time. This is unheard of um, in the hearing submission process. Um, and our next um, participant is not due until 5.25, so um, we're just waiting for uh, them to um, come online. So we'll just give you a breather. Contemplate the, the day.
Um, Ethan, we've just we're slightly ahead of time um, because our presenter that was supposed to be on now has not joined us. So I wondered if you were able to. We can take you now, if you like. Yes, down the front. Thank you. If you take the middle seat. Um, so, councillors, we um, our next presenter is Ethan Bray. Um, submission nine hundred seventy-one and uh, one hundred twenty-three in your booklets. Uh, welcome, Ethan, and thank you um, for stepping in like this. Um, we have ten minutes, so you're welcome to um, present to us. Okay, to, oh, well, thank you very much for uh, having me here and allowing me to speak. Uh, this is a first for me, so I thought I'd give it a crack. Uh, I've had a read through your consultation document uh, and have, had a look over the four crucial issues uh, that are critical to how well the region does over the next few years and uh, into the future. Um, requiring us to prioritise the distribution of rates, address the landfill, uh, and invest in our key water infrastructure. Uh, so the first issue there was the distribution of rates. Uh, it's a vital source of revenue and provides an essential services uh, and maintain our infrastructure. Uh, so we bought out at Fox and Beach uh, five years ago, and we did so because it was affordable. Uh, since then, we they are, obviously the house prices have gone up considerably, uh, yet our income has remained unchanged. Uh, this should remain front of mind when considering the CV-based rate changes. Uh, this is the most significant point there for me. Uh, one of the biggest points I saw from the consultation document was a lack of information from moving the rates from a fixed rate to a CV-based rate for representatives and facilities. Uh, so I guess this is also a question as to is there, a, is there a breakdown on the value add and the pros and cons for this that is available in addition to the consultation document? Uh, it seems like there's a certain lack of equity that because your house is a higher CV, you should pay more for, to maintain the facilities in your district that you may or may not use. Um, well, when you look around, uh, for example, Fox and Beach, a lot of the infrastructure um, around our housing community is non-existent or falling apart. Yet, if you're paying for facilities that are based on your CV, you're paying a significantly higher amount for something you, you never use or don't even have access to. Uh, so that was the biggest point for me there for the, the first issue. Uh, the second issue there is the future of the Levin landfill. Uh, it's long served as a disposal site for our community's waste. Um, as we strive for sustainability and environmental responsibility, it's understandable uh, that operating the site as a landfill is questioned. Uh, however, waste needs to go somewhere, uh, and, paying to ship the, the, and paying to ship the waste elsewhere to make it someone else's future problem, I don't believe actually solves the problem. Uh, it just moves it and makes it someone else's. I've noted that keeping the landfill open and accepting others' waste who are prepared to pay for that shipping that should be the way forward. And this is some short-term pain whilst working towards a way uh, to or using that time to future develop a significant resource recovery zone. Uh, off the top of my head, being a builder, the first thing it came up with was a solution for processing building waste. Uh, it's the largest contributor to landfills. Uh, and I've tried to find somewhere that does recycle it. The only place I found was in Auckland. Uh, so there's a huge market there in the lower North Island to actually develop somewhere where all that building waste can come and be sorted, recycled, reused. Um, so my key point there is that we don't make it someone else's problem. Um, you mentioned that restoring the, the mana of Hokuyo shouldn't be at the detriment of the mana of somewhere else. It's one of my biggest things. You said you want to restore that mana. All for that, but I don't think it should be at the detriment of the mana of somewhere else. Um, if you were removing that waste out of the system completely, then definitely wholeheartedly agree. Uh, also, there wasn't anything in there in the consultation document about how much we currently pay for shipping waste and how that equates to what the shortfall would be in just operating the landfill as it is, um, and what we currently spend on waste removal. Uh, so that was the biggest the biggest couple of points there for that issue. Um, and thirdly, our key water infrastructure, uh, it's the lifeblood of our community. Uh, it's imperative that we prioritise the maintenance and the development of our key water infrastructure. As our population grows and climate change poses new challenges, we must ensure that our water supply remains reliable and resilient. In saying this, the Council's preferred option is to increase debt to undertake the required works at a time when 4 to 5 per cent of the rates increase is to pay interest. It does make economic sense when raising rates will affect the cost of living of every household in the district. That's what you're planning to do, raise the rates. 
They agree that works need to be undertaken, but feel that it is fiscally irresponsible for a council to increase debt levels to do it. Stick within the current budget and look to other means like universal water metering to increase the revenue for water infrastructure. Fox and Beach pay for their water, where else the district actually pays for their water and is metered. The council has acknowledged that a rates increase will adversely affect the residents, so don't plan to have to increase rates because you have debt to pay, especially at the time when interest rates are going up. Look to tighten the belt, not borrow to fill the stomach. The consultation, the consultation, an example of this is the consultation documents. They are not cheap. Uh, take a leaf from Palmy and all there is online. How much would that save when you're looking to, you know, to save pennies here and there? Um, the council acknowledged that high inflation and increasing costs on one hand was one thing that was acknowledged, yet opts to borrow more money on the other. Two of the five causes of inflation are increasing money supply, which is borrowing, and increasing taxes, which is rates. So the Governor of the Reserve Bank has recently fired a short across the bow of the government about increasing borrowing. I urge the Council not to follow suit and remain fiscally responsible during this period. And lastly was the development contributions for that key water infrastructure. As our community expands, new development brings opportunities and challenges. It's crucial here that we incorporate the costs of that necessary water infrastructure into planning and development process. Developers should contribute their fair share to the construction and maintenance of key water infrastructure that support their projects. Now, on this note, I see Fox and Beach's development contribution is just above the rural contribution of a little over $1,000. Uh, my understanding is rural properties don't connect to council sewerage or water, but an area that has seen significant growth, and with the last six years of having no contributions, this is according to the, the consultation document, how can the council justify such a low contribution cost for somewhere that needs so much investment. Especially when the state of the infrastructure is what it is, most roads don't even have footpaths and streets don't have street lights in that area. Hate to imagine what's below ground, where are treatment plants, etc. I believe that for a beachfront community to be truly resilient in the five years to come, it's down to the infrastructure that is installed today. So far in five years, I haven't seen any improvements. If you continue to allow subdivisions in an, in an area decrease in the permeable area, and increasing the risk of flooding, the council should be held responsible when it goes wrong, and we've seen what happens when it goes wrong. The biggest, the biggest thing here is making sure that the infrastructure is in place to deal with those subdivisions, and making sure that the contribution cost is represent, representative of that, of that infrastructure cost. So concluding, uh, I guess the points of the distribution of rates is some more information on those, moving those rates from uh, fixed to CV based. Uh, looking at the future of the landfill is waste has to go somewhere. It's the short term pain to figure out where it can go and then potentially investing in somewhere for it to go. Uh, in investing in our key water infrastructure is a must. It needs to be done. However, I don't think it needs to be done uh, outside of the current budget levels or at least planned inside the fiscally responsible sort of uh, ways. By engaging our community like you are, making strategic investments, we can create a future that ensures fairness, environmental stewardship, and well-being of all of our residents, whilst remaining fiscally accountable. Thank you for your time. Many questions? Um, thank you, Ethan. It was uh, very well articulated, and um, well, I hope it's not the last time that we um, hear from you. And I'm sure... Um, our two local Kerry Kerry Ward members um, will be um, seeking some further engagement with you on some of the topics that are in front of us. But are there any questions of Ethan at all? Deputy Mayor. Yeah, look, thanks. I'm one of the locals along with Councillor Brannigan in your area. I'm outstanding for a, you say it's your first um, submission. <laughs> Can only go down from there, I suspect. <laughs> um, look, it just could I just could I just say that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> I, I got what you saying. Yeah, yeah. Could I just just drill into the um, use of the freeholding account money for the pool? Understood your your thing about an error of council, or, or to put it another way, a dog's breakfast, the original build. Yeah. But given it, it happened. And given that the district is fronting up with an extraordinary sum of money to do the rebuild, 
and given thirdly and finally that it's the be the beach residents will arguably because of proximity use it a lot do you not think it's fair that the contribution come from that freeholding account i see you're saying no but i just yeah. wonder if there's a counter to that i think there's there's more more to it than a yes or no it's what's given up in the process so what else could that money be used for uh, and where else is it planning to be spent if there is is if, there, if there isn't any other sort of logical or any place where that money is going to be spent, then yeah, I think it's fair. I think it's a good resource and it's definitely something, uh, especially during the winter, that you use a lot out of the beach. Um, at the moment, we're travelling in here for so many lessons every Saturday and that. Um, so it's, that's, I suppose, the thing is the best way to answer that question. Um, what else could it be spent on? And just a very quick one. I'm, I'm hoping officers will no doubt pounce on you for a copy of that submission there's a lot of additional material in there and there will be officers reporting on the submissions so there's an opportunity for there to be feedback at an officer level as well to the points that you raise so we need a copy yeah thanks councillor tamihana and i forgot to mention that councillor tamihana is also a resident of foxton so he will um, again be engaged with you yeah, I was just thinking that was actually going to be my point, Ethan, was just to congratulate you on your submission. I think it was a really good, really yes. good submission, and I appreciate it. But it was the correct counsel that you actually have five councillors in this room that connect to Foxton. Um, both myself and councillor Hori Tapa, uh, as Māori Ward representatives, go across the district. Yep. And councillor Tukupua also has very strong connections to Foxton. So there's five of us that you can reach out to if you need to. Come on up. Thank you. Yeah, Ethan, thanks. Yeah, it's been said, Mark. Great, great, um, great submission. Really appreciate it. Um, my question around the, the resource recovery, particularly the building material, and I know you're a pretty good builder. Um, what sort of stuff is that? How is that re, reused? And I think it said Auckland, there's a, a slide up there. How is that, that stuff repurposed and reused, particularly the building? So it mainly comes down to the sorting. So at the moment, when building waste is removed from site, it's chucked in a big skip bin and, and dumped in the landfill. Um, of that, just from my own experience, upwards of over half would be timber. Um, that timber can be either mulched down and used and chipboard or re reused back into building products. Um, at the very least, it can be disposed of in an organic way, whether it's mulched down or, or something. Um, the rest of it, such as so like polystyrene, anything like that, can be uh, all reused and mulched up and used in your x pole and your underfloor insulation. Um, all of your insulation materials can be put back in the machine again and spun back out. Um, a lot of plastics in there, some of it can be recycled, so it's, it's about being able to sort it. So when they uh, do do it on site, um, I spoke with Waste Management and Palmy about uh, doing it and they said they, they can't because uh, you need essentially separate bins for the different, just like recycling anyway, you need to be able to separate out your waste at the building site level um, and then from there it's taken off to where it where it needs to go, uh, whether it's the export factory, if it's a timber resource place, something like that. Yeah, it's just having the resources. Yeah. Yes, boy. Great to see you here. You're our youngest submitter so far that's showed up in person, so I'm personally thrilled by that. Um, I'd like more, but this is this is start. I can see that you've opted for the capital value option. Council's preferred it preferred option and your rates will actually be going down under that change not overall with the rates increase but it kind of decreases that significantly i wondered if you might want to comment on that in slightly more detail given that a number of our submitters potentially the majority of them are submitting to the contrary on the change of the general rate to capital value given that their rates will be going up with a rural property holder yeah. um, as far as those other three questions about the the fixed representation rate, those are kind of just signals for the future. That's why there isn't heaps of supporting information about them. It's just yep. a get how you feel about this, kind of get, get the gist of it. Um, I really like your words about development contributions, but you have ticked no to increasing them. But you kind of, you kind of said um, there that you were more... I think, I think, you think at least the Foxton one should go up. I think also well, they're all really high. The <laughs> one should go down. I'm I'm not sure, but um, yeah, 
I think what's happened here is that I've filled out the submission document, I've read the consultation document, and then when I've had a phone call saying, would you like to speak, I've gone back and reread the consultation document. <laughs> Love it. And I've actually gone through and with a fine-tooth comb, probably more the figures than that, yeah. and seen that the contribution cost there. Uh, so I suppose I'm a little bit contradictory there. Oh, cool. no, just that. wanted to query those. Um, and a little comment in terms of the landfill, I do agree with a lot of the things you said about, you know, just shipping our waste to another district doesn't doesn't solve the problem. But yeah, unfortunately, that decision is separate from the we've we've got an eyesore of an environmental disaster out there that needs to be resolved. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that's unfortunately a separate decision. And I'd, well, I'd love both of those at the same time. That's, that's just reminding Councillor Boyle that he's not to um, make any sort of um, statement about what he might think of any situation at the moment. Um, just, I guess, following on from that point, so uh, Councillor Allen's really good at asking in principle questions. So, given You've, you've referenced the restore, restore the matter of Hokio as being an issue you're not as concerned about. If we were to build, in principle, if we were to build a dump off the back of Dunstan Street, in principle, how would you feel about a focus? the environmental impact of that. My understanding is there is already a landfill there that is all aligned and meets current environmental standards uh, with the you know, with a term to be uh, for a lifespan to 2035, I think it was off the top of my head, um, that has already had resource consent. There is no reason why that shouldn't be used uh, and, and opposed to shipping it out to another landfill with the same consent somewhere else. Um, you may as well use the resource you have, and in the meantime, find a viable alternative until that when that runs out. My 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 opinion there would be that when that landfill fills up, you don't ship waste to landfills anymore. That's that's a, that's your finite. You know, you're not that's a, you've got until then to decide what you're going to do with it. Thank you, Ethan. Um, one final comment I'd like to ask. As a first-time submitter, how have you found the process and, and, you know, just any comments that you'd like to, and feedback in terms of the engagement? Uh, I think it's been smooth. It's been yeah, it's quite quick too. I think it was only, was there a date, six weeks ago or something? Is that, yeah, it's been quite quick and smooth, so it hasn't dragged out, which is quite good. Yeah, in terms of this environment, it's what, was I, what I was expecting. So thank you again for um, being here, and I'm hoping that it's not the last time that you're engaged with Council. Really appreciate your uh, time and the effort that you've gone to to put your submission in, and uh, appreciate you turning up today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. So, um, councillors. Um, Kushla has been in touch. She has said that she is um, unfortunately uh, ill and will not be able to be with us today. Um, and you will note that Judy Selwood had also withdrawn earlier in the day. So, Mr. Kane, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Good try, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not that um, hopefully easy to uh, fool. Um, welcome. And um, since you're our last one before dinner, um, we can even give you a slightly more uh, bit of time if you wish. Well, I was going to say that, Jeff. <laughs> Press me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors. I don't like coming here being a moaner without coming up with some answers, but unfortunately, uh, it's a hell of a difficult job to find the answers to some of the problems you have in front of you. I want to start with a review of what I saw of the Risk and Assurance Committee last week. 
This time last year, I submitted and said that it looked like you had a $4 million deficit in the books. Perhaps if we go to our banker in the room and we say, this time last year, your credit card had a $4,000 deficit on it. You couldn't pay it back, but in the next year you carried on and you ran another $6,000 deficit. So at the end of this year, you've now got $10,000 deficit on your credit card. And the banks come to you and said, what do we do now? You have to find somewhere else. This council last year ran a $4 million deficit. And when I asked the staff, what are you going to do about it? They said, oh, we'll just have to borrow it. This year, you've run another $6 million deficit over and above what you planned in the rates. So we now have a combined $10 million added to our deficit. When I go through that $6 million, I find that $2.1 million was professional services, including 660000 for re consultation or resourcing. Unfortunately, tonight we're saying that we want a 7.9% rates increase. That is only just going to cover the interest bill of the increased borrowing and everything in the next year. So in other words, you're not going to have any extra operating money in the next year at all. On top of that, we get the fact that you've hit your borrowing limit of 125% and you've gone back to your rate payers and saying, can we increase this to 250% please in the next year? It doesn't paint a rosy picture. How do we fix that? And it's very difficult, but one of your councillors gave me an example the other day where for a road safety plan, it was going to cost $15,000. Those sort of costs are just going totally out of control for everything. And it goes right through the whole works environment. When we get to the general rate, we find that we've got 700 farmers in the district with 2,000 properties between them. They currently pay 27% of out of the general rate, your general rate being the $11 million of your income. As a farmer... I'm not particularly interested in the water and the sewage side of it, but it is the bulk of what all your work in this council is involved with. However, I don't like the idea that those general rates are just going to keep climbing and out of control because that interest bill alone is going to be somewhere up around that 7 or $8 million in 12 months' time. So we get on to the issue of capital against land value rates. And and this year we look and say, well, it's a great year to do it. The rural land values didn't go up to a tremendous amount. So for most farmers and most others out there, their rates won't be going up. However, in two or three years' time, and we're talking about a long-term plan here, we're talking about 10 years' effects. We're not talking about one-year effect. We'll probably find that the town or the urban ones go down 20 or 30%, because we've already seen them go down 13 and that the rural ones will stay stable again, and they will get hammered. At the IHACRA meeting a fortnight ago, it became clear that this swap to capital was not as easy as it looked. And the bulk of the problem seems to be with the new highway, which is supposed to be going through this district. And it affects right through from Manukau, not just the new town out here at Tauriika, but right through to Foxton on that strip. And we have seen so many problems arise that I don't think it's any wonder that in the bulk of your submissions, they are all against the capital value of rating. So we decided at that meeting, and I know that federated farmers are coming tomorrow night and are sort of saying that, hey, you know, as a broad view, we're not too worried, but we are against capital. But I don't see this as the year to bring capital value rating in. I think that until that highway is sorted out, you need to delay that decision, that part of your long-term plan, and stick to your rural land values. To those of the iwi here, I just spent half an hour with Moore out at Hokia Beach Road. I have three titles of his land alongside my dairy farm. And the capital value... And he says, well, Grandma's told me I'm not allowed to sell land. We won't be selling any of our land, and that's usual for you anyway. But we are up to close to $2,000 for the rates on that 10-acre block of land. 
And so therefore, it's, you're going to hear this repeated from Peter Everton and some of those others as well. So the capital rating is just creating a problem through those sort of areas. And for the extra bit you'll get out of capital rating on the uh, the major industries, then I don't think it's worth it. The idea of this council is to give services for what we pay for. Uh, when you get Cam Lewis from uh, Tender Tips and that coming in, and he sort of says, well, you know, I, cre I create jobs for 100 people, but capital rating is going to put everything very, very close to the line. I don't think it's worth it for the production of this district. As a farmer, I want to see as much targeted rates as possible. The fact that many of us have several properties under the, or several titles under everything else, we don't mind paying for one swimming pool rate or one library rate per family, but we don't like paying it several times over for the one family. So we have to be very careful that we keep as many targeted rates and that we are paying for what we use as possible to broaden it out. When it comes to your three waters and everything else, it leaves us um, very vulnerable in this council because we know, I know, I work within your infrastructure um, sewerage system. I run the farm at Shannon for the council as well. So I see the problems in all that sort of areas. But how we solve those problems, it's, it's creating competition so that some of those prices out there, at least we know, are genuine rather than... We just, as a council, you can't do $80 million worth of capital spending in a year because we haven't got the resources within the district. 30 to 40 million seems to be all that this district can handle. So those are my comments at this stage. I, I hate to say it, but you needed an 18% rate rise um, because to catch up. And it's just typical of what's coming through and a lot of the other councils. So I'm not voting against the 79 but I'm just telling you that as a council, you're not going to have any extra money to spend. And yet, how come for the last three years I've done these submissions, you've reduced your rates down to that percentage, but at the end of the year, the staff have still spent it. You've just run a deficit over and above it, and it doesn't look good in the books. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. As always, uh, articulate and well-reasoned and um, um, appreciate everything that you've done there. Um, is there any questions for Jeff? Councillor Brennigan. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the submission. Uh, very learned as always. Um, just yet, the significance of H2L in terms of when, when, when and if we move, in your, your opinion, should look more seriously or, again, at capital value, if that doesn't happen this time. But is that around the growth and the, and the price levelling out of For some reason, both O2NL and Tarika have been reflected in the valuations. And so it is changing the land value of any areas close by to that significantly. And as a result, you will hear over the course of the next couple of days that some properties are just totally going out of this way. Now, you can bug around with remissions policy like you've done on Roslyn Road, and you are here for that. But the remissions policy doesn't cut in unless the titles or the land has been done. So it's sort of it's going to leave a lot of willy nilly stuff going on, trying to get rates adjusted to give everybody a fair go. So just just for clarity, you you've said in your submission that you actually think we should go for option three. And so you philosophically agree with the capital value process? When we went through the submission process, very much like the previous submitter, you went through and what's the best and what's the best option. And, you know, when this, when this uh, submission document came out, it really upset me particularly as a farmer, to say that, hey, this is a fair value and we're aiming at the richer people to be able to afford, who can afford the rates. And you can't do a blanket statement like that. Um, 
because you know this pension is living on a lifestyle block outside of town exactly the same and they're the ones which are hurting the most from it it's not a fair value way of saying that it, it straight away made it look like your farmers you're rich now i've got a piece of paper here which shows that the average income this year and our figures are right up to 12 months old as against some of your figures but the average farmer and sheep and beef farmer in the next 12 months will have a gross income of 150,000 from which they have to pay their mortgage, pay their everything else and get take their drawings and everything else out. Um, it doesn't put them in any better bracket than what a wage earner does. And they are not entitled to the rebates, which the lower income ones or the renters are. So I don't think it's targeting the right people. However, you know, we don't want to go straight to a capital value system where you're changing the system bang without really seeing the overall effect on everybody. So when I went through in the initial stages, yes, I went for system three, I mean, the 80%. Then you started to hear some of the outside sort of people and how it was going to affect them and thought, hey, hang on, I'm looking at how it's affecting my rates and what it's doing to our places. But some of these people have got genuine concerns right through the district as to how it's hitting them. Councillor yes, Tommy, um, Tinakwe, Jeff, thank you for your submission. Um, yeah, I appreciate everything you've, you've shared. I just wanted to actually touch on the point around um, your engagement with Matua Mua, actually. And I suppose the question for me there is, um, did he or yourself feel as if the document um, gave enough information to our Māori um, Fanu about the impact of this rating um, on them, particularly in the rural area. I'm just interested to know whether he had, you know, realised what that impact was going to be, or was actually through yourself that helped to identify this was this is what's going to happen to you in this space. Thank you. And last year, I actually brought Mara along to do a submission of his own, because at that stage it was it was similar sort of things on land, um, Maori land. So as much as I will go along with what you say, Mara wouldn't. Have, he was more worried about. Um, the property down there's just changed hands and sort of saying, who's going to lease my land? He says it's not going to be economic for anything and um, we're not going to have any income to do the fencing. But he said, oh, I've been toying with pulling the old house down out in the paddock, but I don't think all my relatives will let me and that sort of thing. So we talked in general, but then he went on for quite a while about the different blocks of land around and some up uh, Lindsay Road and so on and sort of saying, well, all my brothers and that say we're not selling our land that's our custom, but we are getting rated off it. And he understood it all well, um, but I think as you probably acknowledge, there'd be very few of them actually read it and sort of understand to the extent that the rating is, is hitting them. Cheers, Jeff. Really appreciate everything again. And um, I'm sure um, we'll deliberate and consider all that you have seen. Cheers. So, councillors, that brings us to the end of uh, session number two on our hearings. Um, it's now um, time for dinner. We do actually have a break now till um, 6.45, but we might try and start, hopefully, a little earlier if... Um, the submitters are, are with us so that we can finish a little earlier is the thing. So try and be back before 6.40 please.
We are going to start a little earlier, noting that Murray is um, in the room. So we'll welcome you to the table. Uh, Murray will save you sitting in the seat for a while. Let's um, hear what you have to say and um, appreciate your time. So if you take the middle seat, yep, and then push the button on the right-hand side, and uh, then the floor is yours. Okay. Greetings, everybody. I was advised to buy a, a text uh, and uh, email today, or several days ago, to say arrive here 15 minutes early to see how the council works. And I've been there, and I, all I see is a lot of people running around, <laughs> going nowhere. <laughs> so um, I've learned a lot. I know how the council works. <laughs> I can assure you we've been here since one o'clock, um, Murray. Um, now, firstly, I'm deaf, so uh, I, I, I have problems um, uh, with hearing, but um, I'll try and uh, get on with it. So, as you can see, my name is Murray Staples, and I'm an octogenarian. Uh, my wife and I have lived in uh, Hokio Beach and also in, into uh, Levin of recent years. Um, we've been 20 years in this area. And uh, only moved from Hokio Beach to Levin on, uh, for health reasons. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the acknowledge <coughs> the planning and preparation that the, the council staff have gone into in producing this long-term plan. It's a credit to all, and I think they've done a great job. Um, now, with regard to the rating system. Um, I know that is not suitable for all ratepayers, but in our own case, uh, we are not happy with the existing, uh, sorry, with the uh, proposed rating system uh, that just because a, a property is of a higher value means that the, uh, the person who owns that property is able to pay the rates uh, more than the one of a lower value. Uh, and as they all receive the same services. So I support the option one to retain the land value rating base. Um, I'll give the support, a um, support of this in a later illustration. Now, with regard to setting the rate, the council rates increase, I support option one, which is the council's preferred one, um, as Horofanuan needs to be quickly to quickly provide for the forecast growth in population of this and the services. Uh, with regard to that, uh, global warming is having an effect, an adverse effect upon our uh, whole area. So uh, we can't defer any uh, any of these options uh, to um, not to take them forward to the future. Now, with regard to the long term. Uh, plan and uh, with the Hokio Beach um, uh, the tip site uh, we have been affected by that for many many years <clears throat> and then our property down there we had uh, underground uh, sand trap uh, bore system which was uh, affected by the leaching runoff from the underground aquifer and uh, we are against reopening of the, of the closed tip um, however, we have observed that um, ourselves and many others are using uh, the general waste bin for green waste. And uh, so our summation from that is that we should put um, all of our general waste into a, a separate, 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 oh, sorry, a separate separable to the one that's used now. Um, as we... Um, we fill up our general waste bag uh, bin with only green waste and only have a small plastic bag like that for general waste, which is basically a waste of putting that all into the tip. Um, we would recommend that the, the green waste have a separate container of its own and uh, that the um, plastic cardboard should be combined together with glass and uh, that can easily be separate. Uh, uh, separated for disposal 
and that the green waste should be recycled at some site for um, um, res uh, for what's, um, disposal and uh, disposal or and converted into um, mulch. So a, a support council's option option two there. Um, furthermore, to that, we would recommend that the like they do overseas that um, uh, a waste disposal uh, entity or generating facility should be built somewhere in the lower region, or the North Island, and uh, which is um, then could be. Uh, uh, burnt, incinerated, and uh, generate ge electricity from that for the common use. And this is carried out in many, many countries in France and and uh, in other parts of Europe, and have been done for twenty or thirty odd years. Now coming to three waters, um, I've supported the council providing these and. and that we should not be relying on central government to take over these services. Uh, we're the best people in this area to decide what the uh, should be happening with our what, with our waters, and uh, a central government should not be involved in, in trying to do that. Um, I know that's not the uh, the general feeling of a lot of people, but um, I think it's it's the way we should be going. And therefore, I prefer option one to increase the budget and not defer providing any of their provide this is necessary infrastructure to some future time. Levin is a radically flat area, and uh, with an inadequate water stormwater infrastructure, and it's vitally important that we address this before any further major weather events causing major flooding and damage to housing and businesses. We have been uh, ourselves uh, in here in Levin. Uh, we have the last major downpour, downpour uh, several months ago. We had water um, up to just coming into the nearer the, the bottom of the house. Um, as we live in the um, MacArthur Street area, um, so we see that. We should be looking at um, improving the inf stormwater infrastructure um, as soon as possible. Over in Queensland, uh, we, we, we lived there for some time, uh, in the North Lakes area, all new subdivisions over there uh, have swales and they, they have a lot of rainfall over there in a, in a, quick, in a sudden downpours and it's uh, disperses the, the water away from the subdivisions and the houses, which are all built on concrete flat, uh, flat uh, pads. And um, this, um, this promotes, or any having the concrete pads means that uh, the water flow can easily rise up and flood the houses. Um, uh, there's only several places in New Zealand that I've, I've seen that in, in the close proximity. Paparabo is one, um, and uh, the other one would be in, in uh, uh, Matawatu. They have one, one running through there. Uh, we've got a new subdivision in Tararika, which is um, uh, going to be constructed in the next few years, and the development of that should have swaled through it to take off the storm water uh, and not rely on sumps in the, in, the, in the road. So, moving on from there, I further support the water meters uh, to be district wide. Um, we, I was against it originally, but then we were notified that uh, our house in Bird Street. Um, was using excess water and there was no visible sign anywhere uh, of where it, where it was going. So we had to have a plumber come in and go around the whole property and find out where uh, there were three breaks in the pipework. 
uh, on our section. So the water leaks themselves were picked up by the water meter. So from that point of view, I would support that. Um, Okay, moving on from there with regard to the uh, for water three with regard to three waters. Um, once again, over in Queensland, the North Lakes, uh, each new property has to have water tank attached to the house, so, and it's about a not long thing. I'm not sure what it would hold, but probably around about. 2,000 litres, uh, so that can be used for water, uh, water uh, watering of the gardens, and also takes it away from your stormwater system, uh, and that's required from each new build. Um, it can be used for watering or emergencies, if you have a water supply cut out, well then at least you've got a tank full of water sitting there. So, that's with regard to stormwater. Uh, development contribution, I agree with that. I think that's a, that is a very important. Um, for far too long it's been, uh, well, it was abolished or deferred, uh, but uh, with the new subdivisions coming in, councils are the ones that have to... Um, First of all, put in all the uh, underground services, and uh, so somebody could pay for it. And I don't believe that the um, e existing ratepayers should be having to do that. Uh, so that's why there's a development contribution would make a big difference in um, helping the council out to pay for those things. Now, with regard to the uh, rates. Our rural property, uh, which as you can see is in Barclay Grove, we are paying now $3,000 per annum uh, for the new uh, proposed rates. The ones that are uh, opposite us uh, is paying 1827 We've both got four bedrooms and um, there's a $1,200 difference. <coughs> now, we have just one of your people come out and have a look at the place and said, oh, but your place can be rented out as a two-bedroom, two two-bedroom two properties. And we said, well, yeah, but it's not. But it could be. So we're paying $1,200 extra. We actually can see there the exact amount is 1018 I've actually worked out. Uh, as an extra charge, or pay for the double of the services uh, that we were deemed to receive. So we're not happy with that aspect, and that's why I've sort of voted against having the uh, capital value for the rating system. In comparison to that, our property in Bird Street uh, is, um, has a value of 3,372. Uh, as a proposed uh, rates. Now that's $372 more than our uh, Hokio place. And that includes that it has uh, a weight, it has a reticulated retic water, wastewater, curbing and channeling, and footpaths. And that's worth $337 when we don't believe that. Um, this is um, a fair assessment. As we both have, uh, both of these places have four bedrooms. So, thank you for your, your consideration. Appreciate that, Murray. Thank you very much. Um, we've probably got time for a quick question if there is one. Okay, um, doesn't appear to be any questions, Murray. So thank you. I uh, much appreciate your time and thank you for taking the uh, time to submit to us around those issues. Um, and you will be um, considered along with all those others that we have in front of us as well. Thanks for coming out tonight. Our um, 
Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Pariku. Welcome. And um, so this submission is on page 1528, um, and, or 147 of your hearings book. Uh, welcome, Pariku. If you just um, turn the yeah, push the right button, you've got it. And um, we've got 10 minutes, so the floor is yours. Right. I've only really got one <laughs> body of um, interest regarding the dump. Uh, my name's Parikura McGregor. I hail from Hukio on Nati Huyaki Parirakawa. I live at 630-634 Hukio Beach Road, opposite the old dump site. Um, all my life that has been operating in the 70s, I was born 71. Um, yeah, I just want it shut. We pay our rates, we do everything that we're asked to as residents and as tangata whenua. Some of us mana whenua. Um, but that's why I'm appear appearing here today. That's really why I've only come for my little 10 minute slot. Um, regarding everything else, that is the Coney Hitters business with rates and everything else that goes on. This is probably the only one passion I have at this moment because where I'm living is a trust, DS and M. McGregor Whanau Trust. So I'm the youngest of nine others. And I look after the whare, where we're currently living. And our neighbours used to be the Grangers. Um, so, to me, regarding to any of your councillors here that have been newly elected and learning about what's going on and how we're in deficit with the current going on, <laughs> remedial looks like, to me, the only way and something later down the track, only because I have interest in that whenua. Um, one of our whanaunga of my great-grandmother's side, my kuiti side, actually had that property. Right? So that's why I'm passionate. That's why my mother got that property back where we're living. Um, for those reasons, if you go back and research my whanau, you're more than welcome. We've got, I'm transparent. So that's really why I'm here. You know, and I've got Fanonga that are sitting in here, you know, doing the right thing for all of us collectively in our community because we all matter. And that's why I'm here and I'm just wanting to be heard as an individual and a collective, but you just can't see them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. I look, really appreciate the fact that you've bothered to come and tell us that. It, it is important and uh, um, we do uh, certainly uh, take note of your passion and um, why you're here. If I could ask you a question um, initially, um, I noticed on your submission that you've chosen option one in terms of not, um, don't use the site for anything else and just... Not for now. For now, so I'm you're really going to remedial anyway, and I know right. the other side of our environmental law will say that. Yeah, there's another. There's a, there's plenty of different bodies that are presenting, but they only need the one. First, we need to. There's things on that fenua that need to be addressed. Okay, that's in probably until Maori. Yep. Um, yeah. So remediation obviously is your main focus. Yeah, yeah. remediation, and then go. From there, some okay. others will go no, completely not. Yep. But that that space there, and the area space where it runs out onto the run, we've got another property by Pete Everton, yep. that Tartana lease. Yes. Um, there's great ideas that you could use there in the future. Yeah. But okay. Point, they just need to be, we need to say sorry to the land. This is coming from my, the Maori side to say sorry to the Fenua, the the the, the Fenonga that are here implement that type of modi into it. I know a lot of people sort of think, oh, that's, but that's how we are in our tikanga. Um, and then address something later, because I was thinking about green waste, you know, um, recycling those. That said, it's another thing. You've got to think about the smell that will come out of it with some of those green waste, especially if it's food scraps. Like if it's plant matter from cutting off branches and stuff, not as bad. 
but that, that, that space out there with all its hurt is actually quite a beautiful sandy loom space with a lot of stories in it. No one knows because it was sold. But I'm not holding my hands up for a pariraka while they sold that. Nah, that's not mine. What mine is is that we sat there, we always wished the best for it. We couldn't get, we couldn't grasp it back. It's been poisoning and poisoning. We knew it even when, when some of our whanaunga that worked over there, they'd go and scrap metal from there. I used to trespass on your pounds of property. I'd saddle up my horse and I'd be off. I'd just jump the fence and boom. I'd ride all the way out to the Waibudi through those black box, back box. Trespassing. I was just a kid. And I'd see what was there. Because I didn't think, it, oh, I'm free-spirited. I do know now that you have boundaries. And I'm not going to cross your guys' boundaries. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that's why I'm here. Just to be heard, that's all, and noted. Like, is it being recorded? Just that I spoke on it. Right. Yeah, so I've got a whole whānau with me. And I'm grateful for you guys, because when I come to do the workshop, I've seen transparency, vibrancy. And I've seen us, you know, we're a little bit in debt because of this whole sore problem. And, I'm, and we know that, you know. But, you know, miracles are as Justin, Timmy Hart. Oh, tēnā koe parakura. Thank you for coming. Oh, and I know the passion. No. Um, I suppose I wanted to just ask, um, so some of the submissions we've heard today have talked about some of the impacts culturally. I wonder whether you're able to share with maybe us here tonight how, how that, when I'm saying the effect, um, what I heard was there were marakai, there were pātuna, mm. there were things like that within the hukio, um system that fed and nourished people. I just want to know, is that something that you've witnessed yourself um, in I your have. time and the change and the impact it has on you? Is that one change over? Like, so I'll probably be approximately six years old. So um, Granger's, that property there, had, it had a drain that runs through there. Well, it's actually a stream. It was named was by Fetal Fetal because it had red clay on the bottom. Not many people know that. And my family weren't really... They, they, we'd talk around the fire. So that Ahika will speak. Our, our, the way we held on to knowledge was storytelling, which not many people look at verbal um, t- tellings. But yes, there was watercress there, colder. Even the drains that ran through, they all had fresh water before me. We still had twina until we had to stop. So if you went in to get your holding net, you'd end up with rashes. Yeah, the impact of um, the poison and toxins and us as humans thinking that we're doing the right thing out of sight, out of mind. A lot of ours, didn't they all had open cast dumps? You'd dig a hole and chuck your rubbish in it. But regarding kainga that were there, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, also... There'll be middens if they find, if you've got any historical people out there, archaeologists, they'll find things on that property. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just opening, I'm just opening, telling you the stories that were told to us. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're opposite the other whanau across the creek, because I'm on the oxbow. If you look on your maps, yeah. Yeah. There's there's a few streams and underwater puna or boars that run into there. We've been safe. Yeah. Okay, really appreciate the fact that you um, bothered to um, submit to us tonight <laughs> and uh, through this process as well. Uh, look, there's obviously uh, heaps of work in front of us in terms of um, our deliberations and decision making, but uh, rest assured that your comments are noted and um, will be considered along with everyone else's. So thank you for coming and representing. Oh, uh, can I turn this off now? Yes, thank you. Kaki te te Cheers. Bruce, welcome. So, um, Bruce is on behalf of Waitangi Beach Progressive Ropers Association. Um, submission number thirteen hundred and seven. Oh, no, sorry, submission two fifty four on page thirteen hundred and seven, or one hundred and fifty one in your hearings booklet. Welcome, Bruce. Um, you know to turn the right hand button on um, so that we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity of addressing you on the subject. Um, I'm going to speak mainly on the uh, subject of the um, proposed changes to the rating system. I mean, the, the other um, things in there, we didn't have much to say on the water, of course, quite a very not having reticulated water. It's not a thing that affects us too much. I mean, we do have limited storm water and we have, um, of course, sewage, but that's all. Um, and it's basically on the, the, on, on the, on the, on the um, tip, we, um, on, on, we support um, option two. And I don't think there needs too much addressing on that. It's a pretty straightforward thing. But, but, so my time will be spent um, pointing out our objections to moving from a land value based rating system to a capital based rating system. Um, the submission, um, the, the, the page that, that was forwarded with the submission, sort of, I think, um, generates the, the feeling of our community. Um, we're a very mixed um, value uh, community at Wairarere. We, we have some very valuable homes and we have some um, pretty old, um, let's call them good old Kiwi batches. So it, it's a fair range um, in, in the limited number of homes that we have. I mean, there's only, I think, about seven or 800 homes at Wairarere and um, they, they move from multi-million dollar homes to um, very cheap two-bedroom batches. Um, and the, the general feeling is that the value of a person's home doesn't reflect their ability to pay. Um, often the, the, um, the value of their home is determined by their lifestyles. Um, the person that chooses to spend their money and live in a comfortable home develop their um, section around them to provide um, good accommodation, comfortable outdoor living, etc., etc., which reflects the beach life. That's their choice to do that, as opposed to the other person that just um, is happy to live in a batch, but to travel around the world, buy flash cars or do whatever. It, it's... Um, Irrelevant. It's a lifestyle choice. So why should the person who chooses to live in a more elaborate home with a better garden, etc., etc., um, be paying more rates? It, it, it's just the wrong way to go about it. Um, their use of council services is no greater. Um, so basically, the objection is, is, is based around that point that. Um, the ability to pay is not determined by the style of home you choose to live in. The, the second point is, uh, one, one of the bigger points that in there is, the only way that you're going to be able to establish the capital value of the home is based on the cost of the build of the home in the first place, or any additional work that's done and notified to council by the consent process. So what's going, we, we feel what can tend to happen, particularly in, a, in, in an area like ours, instead of building a new home, which will have a higher capital value, higher rating, etc., why not just look at the local outfits that can truck in a cheap home and, and um, do that up slightly? and live in that. Is this really providing better accommodation from the country? And our answer to that is no. The other, the other thing that comes to mind is those that are living in um, smaller batch type areas at the, at the moment or own those properties, if they're going to be looking at doing development of their property, that is an extension um, do up their bathroom, kitchen, work that requires a consent. Oh no, let's just do it ourselves and um, it'll keep the rates down. Now, this is already happening. There's already plenty of non consented work being done at Waitareri. Um, weekenders come in, um, 
you know, it's happening all over the place. It's, it's not doing anything for our community. So these are the sort of base reasons that we object to moving from the land value to the capital value. The other thing that comes straight to mind is because of, of the way we live at White Hariri, anybody building a house, particularly in, in, in the rise area, the first thing that they have to do is put in their own sewage treatment plant. The next thing they've got to put in their three tanks and their water system. Their capital value at their time of build has already gone up because that's the capital they must invest in order to have a home. People building out of Wairarere are now would now be punished under the system of rating because they've the, the necessity to spend the capital initially to get into their home, their rates are going to be higher. Is this a fair go? And we don't think it is. So um, for these reasons, we as a community feel that it, it, it is an inappropriate way to base the rates in this district. Thanks, Bruce. Um, be uh, just a little concerned at the comment that you make that all the non-consented work that has been done around Wairiri sort of doesn't um, sort of almost paints a picture of a, um, a lawless sort of uh, community that goes about and does what it wants. <laughs> I'm not trying to paint that sort of picture quite at all, but it does happen. It is happening. It does happen. And, you know, it, it's hard to um, actually pin point exactly where, but it, it does happen. Uh, I mean, you, you could ask um, many tradesmen, particularly those that are, these days are required to be registered to do work, that's builders, plumbers, electricians, how often they will actually go and ask to do some um, um, maintenance work and find that um, previously there's a stack of illegal work has been performed on that property. And, and, and unfortunately, they tend to be the lower-valued properties listed. Any questions for Bruce? Um, just, Castle just a quick one. Uh, given we haven't got terribly many submissions from people out of wider area, I wondered if you could kind of comment on how many people roughly the Ratepayers Association kind of represents or has, has in their membership. Um, and I can assure um, Bertie that they're, they're not lawless out there if, if they want, where they already have their beautification of entranceway planted. They, they have a lot done already. Yeah. yeah. Um, our our organisation, I think we've currently got about 80-odd um, um, financial members. Um, yeah. yeah. Which... Remembering our, our membership is household-based, not numbers of people, I mean. So we've got 80 households. Or we've got 80 subs collected of, of, of our sub. Um, that was probably representative of 140 people. But, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate your time, Bruce. Um, thank you very much um, to you and the progressive association for everything that you do. Um, I know you keep that community really well connected and um, and we again, um, all the work that you do in terms of um, inputting into council's operations and, and things like this is uh, much appreciated, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to um, just wanted to acknowledge that I'm a financial member of Federated Farmers New Zealand, and although there's no conflict of interest, but I'd rather just put it on the table so everyone's aware um, when they present. I don't actually, I've never actually met Peter, but um, but yeah, just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. Um, so our next submitters haven't turned up as yet, um, but the Federated Farmers representative might have just entered the building. So we're just going to um, 
check that and hopefully they'll be able to come to us shortly. Um, Peter, if you're ready, uh, would you mind joining us, please, um, in the middle there? Yep. So this is, um, um, sorry, Peter Maddox from Federated Farmers, page 100, uh, 1,756 in your folders, or 173 in your Heron's uh, folder. Uh, welcome, Peter, and um, thank you for um, being with us tonight. And we've got some 10 minutes or so, so you're welcome to uh, present to us. Okay, uh, thank you, Your Worship and Councillors. Um, so I take it that you've all got the submission in front of you, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. The main messages from our members are... Um, Farmers are going to take a hit this year in income at the farm gate. Beef and lamb has recently projected a third drop in farm profit for this year. Um, dairy continues to decline in terms of the price of milk solids. So farmers are facing a hard time in the coming 12 months. And anything that's going to add rates to to their um, outgoings is going to reduce the choices they have to invest in farm activities. Also, farmers don't get the benefit of the number of things that other urban residents get, like the three waters. And so any rates scheme that ends up effectively transferring some of that burden to farmers by redistributing the burden and then in terms of capital value, increasing everybody's rates and farmers getting the worst of that in terms of a proportion is unfair. And so really we tossed this around with some other membership locally. We decided that we would prefer option one out of any of those options that the council put forward. Um, that's a, in a nutshell. We really want the council to think seriously about reducing expenditure um, as an alternative to putting up rates. The current rate of inflation is 7.2%. I think the rates increase is 8.2 or 8.3 or 7.9. Yeah. So it's above the rate of inflation. And, and we don't think that's. You know, we're asking all councils to keep their rates below the rate of inflation this at, point, at present. Any questions? Councillor Grimston. Uh, 
um, I'd just like some help for you, I guess, to sell, because one of the rationalisations for keeping rates low is, is, is dropping is a dropping income environment. But can you give me an idea around, on average, what the income increase over the previous five years may have been? Um, I don't have the figures right in front of me. They, As they, they, they say that there were the returns over the last five years were significantly higher than what would be predicted. Uh, I, I don't think that I don't think that's fair. There are many different sides of farming. There's arable, meat and wool, dairy. Um, dairy's probably done better than others, but sheep and beef farming has has really been in decline. The government's policies on uh, afforestation, hundred uh, um, percent, you know, carbon sequestration permitted by reforestry is causing a lot of displacement of farmers and destruction of little communities. People are that's reducing economic. It's going to reduce further economically the um, cohesiveness of the farming sector. Uh, but we don't think that banking on population growth is that wise, um, and we actually think that farmers are going to be facing a hard time, a very hard time in the next twelve months to five years, um, as the as the global economy takes more and more of a hit. We don't think it's going to bottom out anytime soon, and uh, you know we think that this is. Uh, not a good time to be putting up rates, and we think that the councils around the country, including Horofino, need to cut expenditure. Uh, similar to a question I asked um, Christine when she presented earlier, when do you potentially see a good time at this being a good lever to pull? Uh, I, 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 I don't think that there is a good time on the foreseeable Thank future. You. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, thank you for your submission. Um, I just want to draw upon um, one question really around the live and landfill, because um, I noted Federated Farmers had, had opted for option one. Um, I'm actually just a little bit interested to, to understand what federated farmers, how they reached the decision. But secondary, um, if option two is chosen, would federated farmers perhaps some, have some ideas about what they could see the potential use of that property being with um, um, farming? Okay, land? so the Levin landfill, as I understand it, has been closed because it, it's not economic to keep on operating it. And this is the remediation cost of the landfill. So it is a, um, if you like, a compliance cost that the council has to go through to keep the landfill closed. When I canvassed this with our membership in, in the draft submission, a number of them thought that um, they, they, uh, they get a domestic collection, I think it is, um, and I think the part, the part of the landfill fee comes out of that, um, the way that's allocated. Farmers themselves, for farm waste, they have to privately pay for um, farm plastics, you know, bale wrap, um, recycling, um, agrochemical containers. They have to um, partake in privately funded farm schemes for those that are outside the cost of ratepayers. And it's only, um, if anything, domestic waste that farmers in Horofenua may get some benefit from, but there's no curbside collection. They still have to drive to a landfill as such. Um, and when when I discussed this with some of our members they who, who responded to our, our circulation of the draft submission, they said that they would prefer option one to any other option in terms of what you could remediate that for, I haven't seriously given any thought to option two. 
Um, thank you very much. I know we're pressing for time, but um, I suppose one point I picked up on, and that is, is the way that farmers have come together to privately um, get rid of their, um, their their plastics and that type of waste. I think that's an interesting point for council to pick up on because I, I'd like to actually understand what that is and whether that would support the wider district waste minimisation that we're working towards. Okay, so there's two main private schemes. I can briefly cover them. Um, one of them is PLASBAC. Um, and they recover bale wrap, um, and farmers buy a um, like a mini bale, plastic bale that they put their bale wrap in. They have to wash it and then put their bale wrap in. Every so often, it's collected by plants back and taken to a recycling facility. Agrochemicals are handled by Agricovery. That's the other main scheme. And Agricovery has participating brands um, for agrochemical containers that participate in a scheme whereby when a when a uh, customer buys some agrochemicals, a percentage of the cost of that, and it's a very small fraction, like it's a few cents per container, goes towards the recovery scheme and Agricovery runs collection um, events three or four times a year. In various locations, sometimes it's a bit more, sometimes it's a bit less. When um, there's a you know enough um, containers ready to be collected and recycled, yeah. But it's both of those things are, are outside the, the rate system, if you like. Thank you very much, Councillor Board. Uh, just a quick one. So on dog registrations, I know you guys have gone for a team of five dogs on your table now. I wanted some kind of anecdotal comment on what number of dogs as, as a team generally is five. Is five well, typical, five, but five, five can be a yeah. yeah a decent team for a farmer. Some farmers can have more. Some yeah. farmers can have less. And my other question on that was, of the other councils you've listed, which is the more preferable to you? I note Masterton having the initial hundred dollar fee, which is significantly more than ours, but the reduced subsequent dog fee. In the balancing of those, do you yeah, do federated farmers have a view or a preference? Well, yeah, we prefer a team. Uh, you yeah, know, most farmers will have a team of working dogs. So, so it, it would be based the, on the, cost. The, the bottom line on five dogs is yeah. a good way for us as councillors to be estimating what the preference would be. Yeah. Cool. Appreciate your time, Peter. Thank you very much. Now, I know you guys put a lot of work into submissions like this, but please be assured that we do read them and take note of them and, and will be uh, fully considered as we uh, enter into uh, d a difficult deliberation period in front of us. Uh, the dilemma for us is being able to obviously balance the budget and make sure that we do uh, provide the um, the level of service that our, our residents expect us to do, but I uh, really appreciate your input into that, uh, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, a, a mihi to Dave. I see you sitting there, one of my um, old work colleagues, and my cousin sitting on the other end. Uh, big mihi to you guys, and probably it's appropriate to mihi to our uh, our pa partners in terms of kaitiaki for this area, our Murupoko cousins. Um, my name's Tom Nicholson. I'm a teacher at Horofanua College. I teach science, maths. Currently this year I'm teaching PE and health. I uh, grew up in this area. I went, I was not, I'm, I'm an old boy of Horofanua College. So I have a vested interest in what happens in this area. Um, I'm Ngāti Raukawa, Pare Raukawa. Pare Raukawa is situated out, out on Hokio Beach Road. 
That's where the dump's situated. The dump is approximately a, com- a kilometre away from our marae. Um, the awa that I, I um, whakapapa to is Hokio Stream. That's, that's about a kilometre away from the dump. Um, I grew up collecting kaimona from Hokio Beach. Again, that's a, a, that's a kilometre, about a kilometre away from the Hokio Dump. So, the dump's a big issue for for me and my hapū, Pāreraukawa. Indeed, for all of Ngāti Raukawa. Um, it's my understanding that the dump was a, was a bit of a travesty in the first place. Uh, the council were bound by resource consents and obligations that were never, that were put in place when the dump was set up, that were never adhered to. So in terms of a, a, of, of a starting point, that's an absolutely horrific starting point. Um, it's a dump that's situated on porous soil, where the water table is close to ground level. Now dumps with, with the leachate, that, that's a dump site where the leachate from, from the waste is making its way into the water table. That's an absolute travesty. Um, it's closed now. I understand it's closed for 18 months. It needs to stay closed. It, it's not a site fit for purpose. Um, modern dump sites are located on areas where they have a clay layer between the water table and the dump itself. So that stops liquid and leachate reaching the water table. Modern dump sites also are lined, so that's a double protection there. So this dump site has none of that. It needs to be closed for good. Um, my understanding is that it's currently, it's currently under the management of Midwest Disposal. Now, Midwest Disposal is a 50-50 joint venture between waste management and Enviro Waste. They are both companies that are owned by the Chinese government. That's quite distressing for for Pareraukawa. be distressing for anyone that's got more than two brain cells to rub together. I, I doubt the Chinese government are concerned about any environmental environmental impact that a poorly run or poorly situated dump site would have on the environment. So it's got to close. Um, Pararoko would support on that submission form option two in terms of closing the dump. Um, We think there, there, there is, well, it's obvious there's been some environmental impact so far and that needs to be cleaned up. So that's sort of why I'm here to say that. I'm guessing lots of people are saying it. But so yeah, any questions? Thank you, Tom. That's a brand. Yes, I appreciate your uh, submission. Um, just you talk about Midwest disposal. Uh, you're aware that our waste now goes to Bonnie Glen. To where? Bonnie Glen. Bonnie Glen, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, are you aware that Midwest Disposal own Bonnie Glen? I am, yes. Yeah. So I'm just liking your comments about the Chinese government and Midwest. Yeah. So while we, our waste is now going to another landfill that the same corporation owns. Yeah. yeah. We, we, it probably doesn't sit well with us either. Okay. That, we're not happy that, that people outside our door here were able to transport their rubbish to our dump before it was closed. So we certainly wouldn't be happy with the idea that that we bundle our rubbish up and send it somewhere else. We'd probably be more, um, we'd be happier if you guys or the council did something to minimise the waste that we create. My understanding is, I think it was on Sunday, last night, um, on Sunday, 
the Sunday program, that 50% of waste in landfills comes from building sites. And they wrap their building sites in plastic now. And they don't recycle that plastic. While we've gotten rid of plastic out of our, out of our um, supermarkets, you can have probably two months plastic involved in, in, in one construction site. So, so minimise the waste. Um, educate people in terms of in terms of creating less waste, recycle whatever. Cut down on plastic, for Christ's sake. A couple more, Your Worship. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we are we are a um, a really good submission by a um, local builder just just earlier tonight. Yeah. And he talked about. I noticed you in your submission you, you haven't ticked uh, the resource recovery option for the landfill if we choose to close it. But but you know, use it for something else. Yeah. And he talked clearly about the progress of the program that you're talking about. Yes. And he's got quite some knowledge of it in Auckland, um, South or somewhere in Auckland. Um, and he talked about the, the building recovery option of the building waste and repurposing building waste, which is potentially an option there. Yes. Do you think potentially that is something you could you could support if it's done well? Well, I do know that um, um, Te Waimamo Rokoa have just completed a new building project which created zero waste. So if they can do it, you guys can do it. Okay. And finally, just a touch of site correction, I think you referred to the new the new landfill, so there's the old dump and the new landfill, um, as being unwind. Is that how I understood it? I don't know that there is a new landfill, is there? Well, the current landfill has just been closed. So there's the old dump side of it. Yeah, course. yeah, it didn't, wasn't yeah, lined. In the landfill. Yeah, so the new lined. landfill is lined. Say again? The new landfill. Well, the lined landfill has just been closed as lined. It's the when same. did that happen? It's the same. Well, it's lined, but the new cells are put in. Say what again? It was lined when the new cells were put in. The new cells? Yeah. Is okay. that? Okay, we won't get into semantics. Okay, in the life cycle. It's the same, it's the same liner as they use at Pony Glen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The water table's still too close to the rubbish. Yes, and tell me how. No, I think I'm going to talk enough. Thank you for your submission. Um, look, I just wanted to ask um, a question around the landfill, and I've asked others this evening too. Um, Whanau have submitted um, around the loss of cultural practices through the landfill. I wonder whether you're able to share with the group this evening about, in your own experience, the impact of the pollution or the leaching um, from the landfall and how that's impacted use of the hooky or stream in the wider area, if there's any way you can articulate that for the group. Absolutely. Look, um, there's no question that because of the, the porous nature of the site, that leachate has made its way into the water table. Now, that water table is down is upstream from a stream that, that passes um, through Hawkeye Township out to the sea. Now, every year, Pariroka would do would, would go out and um, and harvest eels. We call it the tuna heke, where all the eels that that um, um, they migrate once a year, make the way to Tonga and uh, breed, and um, their offspring offspring make their way back. We haven't done that in, in um, well since I was a child, actually, since I was at secondary school, probably. 40 years now. We haven't done it. Now, now that's not to say other people don't do it. But we don't do it. Because, because we think the contamination that's, that's, um, that is uh, in the stream and has been built up for some time um, certainly contaminates the, um, the, um, the animal life. Um, so one of the reasons we, we would collect those eels uh, uh, would be to feed visitors. We won't feed our visitors eels that have been uh, in an environment that we think is toxic. And there's no getting around. Last year, we had the biggest news article uh, um, that I saw in our local paper. We had swans dying. You know, swans as big as a small child. That's a big animal. Dying in, in, on the lake shore. So that's a big animal to be dying. That, that that was along with all the small animals, the fish, eels, smaller birds. So that's a toxic environment. Um, I'm under no illusion that 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 the outlet at Hokio um, Beach 
which is down uh, stream from the dump is, is, is possibly um, more toxic than the lake, which is toxic enough to kill a swan. Thank you. So, councillors, we have one submission left for tonight. That is um, Jason Reid. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Um, yeah, which is on page 1,792 of your folders or 180 of your booklet. Um, the floor is yours, uh, Jason. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to um, put in here, I don't support the increase rates model. Um, I've got four points. Um, sorry, I have to read from this. Um, we're concerned about, about being asked to pay for services that we don't receive. Um, we have a, a septic tank that does all its stuff. Uh, we have a bore for our water. Uh, we don't use horophenol infrastructure. Um, for us, it's a point of principle. Um, second, um, we want to pay what's fair. Uh, to us, that's the service excluding water infrastructure services, water waste, drinking water as point one, and stormwater. Um, uh, back up of that also is that we pay maintenance for our bore um, filters. We're paying all on top of the rates that we're paying now. Um, third, our concern with approach to allocate rates on basis of capital value. We have a lot of older people in our area. Well, we're in Manukau. Um, and we're concerned for them. They're asset rich and income poor. A lot of them are retirees. Um, either neighbours on either side. Um, so we're concerned for our community in that sense. Um, and you know, we don't want to, we're concerned that the council is going to make a huge amount of older people worse off than they are at this current state with the um, rates going up. Um, fourth, um, increase, uh, sorry, increased cost of growth should be borne by developers. Uh, we strongly feel with um, developers are going in there and needing infrastructure um, that they should be contributing that side of things themselves. Um, not through our rates, especially that we um, basically don't have those facilities and using them. Um, we understand there should be growth, and we're all for growth, but if there's an income to be made by the developers and they're located in that location, it should be up to them to get that and work that through other, ven uh, other venues. Yeah, sorry, other avenues. Um, that's what I can say. I've just asked the um, Caro to check your address, which is on yes. there, because I would have thought by um, your submission that you are actually a, classed as a rural um, ratepayer. Therefore, you won't be charged for water and wastewater connections because you don't have the ability to yeah. obviously service that as well. But yeah. Your submission seems to indicate that you are paying for that. I just we are paying rates. Um, right. at, um, I'm not sure how much, but what we've been asked to pay on top of that is, I think, probably about sixty percent more. So when you say, sorry, when you say asked to pay on top of that, or the increase. Oh, yes. yes, right. Yes. So, so the increase, increase is yeah, yeah. It's, okay. 
just almost like another if I can I'm able to send them out. Yeah. So probably another thousand dollars on top of what we're paying. So it's roughly about that. No, no, you're right. Okay. All right. Yeah, cool. But there's no charge for water and wastewater. No. I hope not. <laughs> no. Okay. Just just want to clarify that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um any questions from any councillors? Okay, um, now, can I ask how long you've been at that address? And um, We've been there for about five years now. Okay. Um, our neighbours have been there a long time, uh, i.e. right top retirees. Yes. Um, just other thing also is that the road access to get into our street is privately owned and we all got shares, so we've got to upkeep that, that as well. That as well. So it's another cost that we've got to forfeit when it comes to it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, interesting. And are you impacted by the proposed O2L? Um, um, yes, yes and no. Yeah. Um, we worry about the community as well, the ones around us. Um, but yes, what the increase, um, we, well, one like myself, I'm self-employed, i travel a lot for work, so I've got my own costs now I've got to worry about as well. Just, yeah. Right. But how far is the road proposed, or the new expressway, from your property? How far? Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably about five, six minute drive. Okay. I think. Yep. As far so as it's just because we're in Manukau, so south of Manukau, yeah. Jason, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time to um, submit to us. Um, as I've said to, as you've heard, um, we have a lot of submissions in front of us and yeah. um, deliberations are at the end of the month, but we've got a lot to consider. And um, the fact that you have bothered to submit, you know, obviously means that you are concerned around uh, those um, issues and um, they will be duly noted. So, yeah, thank you again. Yep, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very no. Um, Before you close the meeting, I've just got a quick question um, around process. So we've read all the submissions and we've finished day one of hearings and due to time constraints and just letting things flow. Um, we've not all asked questions or we've kind of held back. Um, and so at what point are we or during this can raise questions or like if we want to explore more detail or get more information around what submitters are, you know, those key messages and we need to seek further understanding in order to go into deliberations with data or uh, with more modelling or like when's a good point to to do that without holding up like do we do it at the end or do we how would you like or do we do it offline do we just email through our questions to officers uh, through your worship um it's probably a combination of all of that. So what I would ask is, like, I know that some elected members are already sent some emails in saying, I'd like to see this. Uh, we're obviously, as officers, writing a note of things, of when particular things get raised, whether that's uh, um, where there's been something said that we think might be an error or misinformation so that we can provide some accuracy to that or where someone has, um, there's been a few times where, elected members have said I'm keen to see more information about that uh, we're hoping that at the end of tomorrow we can do a check in with elected members that just says what's on your mind what are the additional things that you're wanting but the expectation is also next Wednesday uh, at a council workshop uh, we're going to yeah we, we're going to be having the here's the work we're doing to prepare draft deliberation reports 
uh, what additional advice information do you need in order for you to make an informed decision. All I would say is the sooner you signal or indicate that to us, the better position we're going to be in to deliver that for you. Um, so for ex particularly in relation to other models associated with rates, I'd ask um, the sooner you can give us the steer on that, the sooner we can do the modelling and the sooner we can also seek legal advice on, you know, whether it be additional differentials, whether it be phasing, you know, without giving you ideas, um, those sorts of things will have ramifications. Um, That's your question. Cool. Um, so thank you, everybody, um, for your uh, participation and engagement today. It's gone quite... Sorry? Right. Yes, you are, you are, everything can stay on the tables. Um, the, door will be, the doors will be locked. Um, so we start at 1 o'clock tomorrow, okay, um, for our next... Um, lot of sessions so rest well and um, see you tomorrow oh I need to well we haven't closed the meeting because I'm adjourning the meeting what's the protocol adjourn so we don't need a key is that what it's probably the end of the day okay yeah thank you Amen.